Okay, good evening everybody. Welcome back to Exploring the Lord of the Rings. This is session 30 tonight. Now come on, when we started off, did you think we'd get as far as chapter 7 by session 30? Um, so this has been great. Thanks for joining us uh, in game tonight. We're back on the Crick Hollow server, so if you want to uh, join us for our uh, Lord of the Rings Online field trip this evening, we'll be doing that um, after our class discussion here, our, our book discussion. And tonight we're going to be talking about that passage which for so many has been so fraught when Goldberry answers the question, who is Tom Bombadil, merely with the phrase, he is. That's the, the, the first section we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, so I'm pretty... Um, I'm pretty, I'm pretty excited uh, to go over that whole opening section there uh, in chapter. I say whole section, right? We saw how far we got last week. It's all good. Uh, so thanks everybody for joining us. Um, before we uh, we dig in, though, I've got uh, a, a one quick announcement that I want to make. Um, you may have heard me, say, you know, you've certainly heard me before talk about MythMoot, our annual conference. Um, which is sort of nationwide and worldwide, and we had such a wonderful time at MythMoot down in uh, in Leesburg, Virginia, last June, this past June. Well, I've also mentioned that this year we are making a push to have more regional conferences and different. Because I know not everybody can travel uh, to uh, uh, to come to MythMoot as much as you might want to, so we're wanting to have more events near you, near, near lots of people, you know, all over the place, uh, and, uh, see if we can create, you know, they'll be a little, they'll be smaller, but they'll be, you know, accessible and inexpensive and really fun, uh, and a great opportunity to connect. So we're having, we've had these sort of smaller regional events by our intrepid folks in the mid-Atlantic region, uh, who have been great self-starters, and that's kind of where, where MythMoot was born, really. Um, so... That's been great. But we're venturing outside the Mid-Atlantic region this year and getting some of these things together in other places. And our first one is in the Midwest, and it is the American Midwest, of course, and it is happening in October on Columbus Day weekend, Saturday of uh, Columbus Day weekend. It is going to be located in Iowa, uh, in Waterloo, Iowa. So it's actually, if you're anywhere, um, you know, the the place where it is, Waterloo, Iowa, is like... A couple hours drive from a whole bunch of I was it was funny, you know, when I was first talking about this event, my first response, I'm not going to lie, my first response was Iowa. Really? Like, how is that convenient for anybody? But then I was looking at the map and I was like, dang, look at that. You know, it's only a couple hours away from like Chicago, Minneapolis, St. Louis, like the whole bunch of of uh, of like is it, there's like millions of people that are actually a pretty convenient drive from Waterloo, Iowa. So it's a small place, but it's kind of situated in the midst of a bunch of big places, all of whom could conceivably get there. So if you are in the Midwest, if you are in any of those uh, uh, any of those those areas around uh, Iowa or even in Iowa itself, uh, we hope that you will be able to come and join us. I'm looking for I've never been to Iowa before, so I'm really looking forward to getting out there myself. I'm going to give a talk. There are going to be several other talks. Um, by some by uh, by uh, by faculty members there um, in the the sort of uh, schools together that have gotten together. We're doing this in partnership with Hawkeye Community College, which is there. We have a, a friend out there at the community college who invited us to come out, and it's been really great working together on that. I wanted to show you where you can get information on this. Uh, if you go to the Signum, Signum University site, signumuniversity.org. Um, and then there's look for this uh, green icon here for our uh, for the for this event. Uh, click on here; it will give you some information, schedule for the day. Um, it's this conference is really cheap. It's fifteen dollars for general admission, ten dollars if you're an undergrad, uh, and that's for the whole day. And it includes lunch. You get lunch with that too. So it's uh, it's super it's super easy. If you um, uh, if you want to sign up, just click on this button, the join this event button over here, and it'll take you to the registration page uh, to uh, to do your sign up and pay a registration fee, and you'll be done. It's really cool. So I hope that um, uh, that a bunch of you will be able to join us. Those of you who are in the Midwest who have been kind of wishing you could make the trip out to the East Coast, and I know many of you are not in either of those places, and there's more coming up. So uh, we're going to be, uh, so for instance, we are planning a text moot 
down in Texas. We're going to be down in Fort Worth, Texas uh, in January this year to do uh, to do our first event down south, uh, which is going to be cool. So looking forward to that. We're I'm working on a working on a California one, too. So we're hoping to. And for those of you in Europe, yes, it would be great. I would love to do one out in Europe. Uh, and I have a couple ideas uh, about that, too. So we're 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 getting there. And I'm uh, I'm 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 pretty excited. Um, so, um, see, exactly, exactly. What, what's your name? Man of, oh, Man of Rohan. Right. I'm, I was, I was, uh, putting your consonants together weirdly in my head. Um, exactly. I was not, it's not that far from Minneapolis. Only a few hours from Minneapolis. You could totally make it from Minneapolis. Um, but, uh, anyway, yeah. So, so, so we'll see. Anyway, um, it should be, uh, um, it should be a lot of fun. Really inexpensive, great time uh, with uh, with really fun Tolkien people. Good conversation. Oh, oh, wait, and 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 in addition, right near the campus here, there's this arboretum where we're going to be. Ha- I think we're we're going to be having lunch there, and we're certainly going to be retiring there at the end of the at the end of the afternoon. And they have like a hobbit hole set up and a party tree and like hobbit golf and stuff. It's going to be super awesome, like hobbit themed activities at the end of the day uh, in coordination with the conference. Uh, it was just pretty awesome that that uh, worked out. So it's going to be uh, it, it's going to be cool. Ooh, Tony, a Denver moot would be like a a a, a, a misty mountain moot uh, up in up in the mountains. That would be awesome. I totally agree. Uh but um, anyway, so just wanted to make sure that you knew that this was happening. And the date is Saturday, October 7th. Uh, so, you know, there's still time. But of course, we're, 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 we're approaching that. So anyone who's in the general American Midwest area, I hope you'll uh, think about coming out to join us. It should be a really, a really great time. So, all right. End of announcement. Now, uh, so tonight's class has said, who are you? That's what we're going to be talking about. Uh, uh, Frodo's famous question uh, and the even more famous answer uh, to that question. However, um, I wanted to do, as, as always, uh, to uh, talk about a couple of the posts and questions uh, from our discussion board. And the uh, first thing I wanted to do is, uh, Jonathan, I want to acknowledge your really interesting post on uh, Virgil's eclogues uh, following up on um, the thing the things you mentioned last time about willow trees. Um, and I, th- I thought it was really interesting. Um, I didn't I didn't. It was uh, a little too long for me to fit on a slide. So I didn't I didn't put it on a slide. Um, <clears throat> I commend it to anybody, you know, looking at our discussion boards to, to check out your 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 full post on that, is, which, which is really cool. Um, the thing that I would uh, the, the the comment I would have. Um, so Jonathan basically was sort of looking at Virgil's eclogues and looking at the description. It started with that reference to the willow trees, uh, uh, you know, the sound of the willow trees bringing on sleep, you know, kind of like it does to the hobbits. And uh, and in that connection, you know, uh, Jonathan was pointing out how when he looks at um, when he looks at the the, you know, sort of starting with that old man willow connection uh, with the willow trees the guy that he's described, you know, the, the sort of the farmer being described in the eclogues there begins to sound a lot like Tom Bombadil. And there are some really interesting connections there. Um, my sense of that, Jonathan, is in, I, in a sense, I think that that's coincidental. Not totally coincidental. I mean, coincidental in the sense that I think that this is an instance of both basically Virgil and Tolkien both being interested in a kind of a similar thing, right? So they're they're talking about that thing in kind of similar ways, uh, not because Tolkien's referring to Virgil, but but again because both of them are sort of sharing a similar interest. And the thing that I think is um, uh, the thing that I think is interesting there uh, is. Um, uh, oh, sorry, I just noticed a quick pause. Pause for a second. I just noticed a quick uh, a quick point. Um, I think somebody was asking about uh, the uh, interface uh, for the blind. Yes. Um, if you want to, we can, if you are, um, if you are blind and you are, uh, you're listening to the class and you want to be able to interact in it and ask questions, uh, we do have an interface for that. Send us an email at info at signumu.org. Info at S-I-G-N-U-M-U dot org. Uh, and we'll make sure to get you connected uh, with uh, uh, with the interface that we have been using uh, for that. So, um, yeah, good. Uh, all right, hang. On, there we go. Yes, 
Yeah, see, in fact, there I'm just uh, getting a notification from... Oh, hang on a second, I seem to have lost, lost my Twitter feed here. Where did my Twitter feed go? I still have it? Oops, sorry. I've confused myself here with my uh, with my tech interface. Did I lose it? I might have lost it. Oops, yes, I did. I had to start it again. Sorry. Um, uh, too many, too many, uh, too many broadcasts. There we go. Excellent. Okay. Sorry. Um, all right. So, uh, uh, so as I was saying, um, I am. Uh, 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 yeah. So for the for the bind, please do it. Uh, if you email us, we can get a we can get you connected, Marianne. I see that post there. Um, so okay. Anyway, so uh, so Jonathan, that's what I was that's what I had to say about the 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 Virgilian thing is again that they're kind of interested in similar things, and the thing that they seem to be interested in, right? Virgil is writing about like this farmer who has like tamed the wilderness, like you know his his farm is like this little oasis of order in the middle of chaos, right? And and you know there's this sort of similar interest in a kind of contentment and self sufficiency, right? And they're coming at it from different directions. Tom Bombadil is not the same, and yet. Um, so for as much as it seems to me, um, that they don't, um, you know, it's not like they're talking about the same thing. It's not uh, like Tolkien's, uh, uh, like Tolkien's alluding to the eclogues or something. Um, but it still is kind of interesting that although they are coming at it from very different angles, um, they're not, um, uh, they, you know, they, they, it sounds similar, right? The way they, end, the, I, I think that the, the similarities that you notice are, are legitimate, right? And interesting, um, just because even if, you know, in, in a sense, almost more interesting in that it's coincidental, right? Um, uh, and that's something actually, it's another thing that I often find um, sometimes when I'm reading source criticism, again, people try, trying to argue that Tolkien is making an allusion to a particular source. Um, I often find myself uh, wanting to say, well, now hang on a second, you know, I, um, I get the fact that you're wanting to make a connection between what Tolkien is doing, and the, but the connection seems to rest upon, I think Tolkien is making an allusion to this, like he's, it's, it's a direct reference to that. And in my mind, I want to say, well, you know, okay, maybe, and if so, that's kind of cool. But in my mind, the mere fact that you can show the similarity, like it doesn't even need to be a connection. I don't care if Tolkien never read it. If you can put these two things in parallel and show these two authors coming at the same idea from two totally different angles are doing similar things and, and talking in similar ways. Like, that's interesting. Like, that's really cool. Um, so anyway, it, it, in my mind, Jonathan, that's what's going on there with Virgil and Tolkien. But it's still interesting, right? I like it. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, anyway, okay, cool. Um, so let's... Um, but let's go on to the post that I was super excited about uh, uh, from today's today's post. So, um, Irindis, oh man, Irindis, you nailed it! Holy cow, Irindis, I read your post, and I was like, I don't know if you've ever read Dracula before. We just did Dracula in the Mythgard Academy a few months ago, and I love Dracula, and so I was. Um, I was I, I kept thinking I, I kept thinking of Van Helsing in Dracula uh, in that uh, terrible Dutch accent that uh, makes Janus Dean Redeker cringe, and uh, I was you know I thinking you know you know like, I am dazzled I am I am dazzled with so much light oh my goodness it was awesome Irindus okay so here's Irindus's observation about Goldberry. Uh, the discussion of the name Goldberry not sounding appropriate for a water spirit got me thinking about what the daughter of a river might be. 
What does the river nourish? The obvious answer is the flora and fauna surrounding the Withywindle. Perhaps berry is metaphorical for the fruit of the river plants, a golden flower among the reeds and lily pads. In particular, water lilies can pr produce a yellow flower, and the yellow iris grows in reed beds, reeds and water lilies being the two plants explicitly named in connection with goldberry. If you come across such a flower in the woods, might it look like a golden berry upon the river or along the river bank? Goldberry's role in Middle-earth has always been a mystery to me, but I now strongly suspect she's the spirit of the river flowers, the daughters of the river, rather than a, river, than a water spirit. The comparisons to a reed by a pool and a queen clothed in living flowers or a gown green as young reeds create an undeniable connection to flowers and plant life. Tom will later explain that he first met Goldberry sitting in the rushes by the pool of the Withywindle where the water lilies first bloom in the spring and linger latest in autumn. The longevity of the lilies may be due to her influence as a flower spirit. Oh man, Irindus, this was awesome! Like this is one of those one of those things where I you know I I, I never I never thought of that before. I have always come into that with the assumption, right? She's the daughter of the river, right? So obviously she's a water spirit, right? The river is a, the, you know, the, the spirit of the river is a water spirit. She's the daughter of the river. So she's a water spirit, like in some way, a lesser or kind of derivative water spirit in some sense. Um, but Irindus, the way that you are thinking there um, is, is, is lovely. It's really, really good because that's exactly the, when you think about the relation, and I think I even said something vaguely like this. I know I have at some point, but I sometimes forget when I say it. Um, when you're thinking about the relations between like, uh, allegorical figures in an allegory or between like deities in a mythology, when you're looking at like the, 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 the marriage of, 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 of spouses or the, parental relationships or the brother-sister relationships, right? Um, it, um, uh, you have to, um, uh, you, you, it, you, you, you end up thinking in those kinds of allegorical ways, right? What does it mean of the marriage of Manway and Varda? The, there's a kind of symbolism there, right? Uh, intrinsically, just as in Greek mythology, right? The, the, the brother and sisterhood of, uh, of Artemis and Apollo, right? There's a, there's a kind of a symbolism there, right? That, that works, that makes sense. Um, you know, both sort of the similarities and the differences between Apollo and Artemis and the way that they are, that the way that they are a kind of team. So the way that you're thinking of the daughter of the river, thinking about it in that sort of more of an allegorical sense, right? Not, she's the daughter of the, of, of the river, and so therefore she is kind of like the river too, right? Or she's like the heir apparent to the river or something. Like, and instead of thinking of it in like human geolog genealogical terms, to be thinking of it in more abstract allegorical terms like this, which is exactly how you do it. So what is the daughter of a river? And the idea that like... Not just that she's associated with water plants, or rather, not that she's associated with water plants because she is water, and so therefore she's the river, and therefore associated with river plants, but that she's associated with river plants because she is a river plant, like she's a river plant spirit, rather than a river spirit itself. And I'm telling you, I've never thought of that in my life, and it is awesome. I think this is an, an absolutely fantastic reading. In fact, it's one of those readings which, as soon as I read it, I'm like... How did I ever think anything else? How can I ever again think anything else? That is, it is just, it is absolutely perfect. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I completely agree. And I, you know, I kept going back in my mind over all the things that we've already seen with Goldberry, the descriptions of her, um, the, 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 you know, Tom's lyrics about her and you think, I mean, everything about how Tom talks about her, um, is, is completely uh, not water related, but water plant related. And by the way, I even, this is only half of Irindus's brilliant post in the second half, uh, of her, uh, of her post. She then went on to, to, uh, talk about one of, um, one of the Andrew Lang, uh, uh, fairy tales from one of the colored fairy books. I forget which color it was. Um, which basically is a, a fairy story about, a maiden who is transformed into a water lily, a yellow water lily. Um, and, you know, her beloved has to, like, uh, free her, and she transforms back from a water lily into a woman uh, at the end. 
Um, and I don't know, Irindis, you know, you were sort of asking, you know, I'm not sure if, if we should assume that there's a reference there. We certainly can assume that Tolkien read it because we know he read Lang and, and, and uh, there's no reason to think that he didn't read all of the of Lang's fairy books. Um, but again, even there, I'm not um, I'm not worried particularly about like, did he know that? And is he making a reference to that tale? Certainly there's a precedent, right? There's a precedent for this uh, um, thinking of a water lily, at, you know, sort of the juxtaposition, right, of yellow water lily with a beautiful blonde haired maiden. That by itself is a really, you know, to me, a really fascinating um, um, precedent. So, Tony, absolutely. When you just think of the description of her, not even the 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 metaphors or, or anything like, you know, the, those the metaphors and similes we were talking about before. But, Tony, as you're saying, just the, the basic, right? Green dress, blonde hair, right? She looks like a water lily. And think back to the scene, you know, the, the scene that I gave the subtitle in her element, right, where she's surrounded by the bowls of water with water lilies, right? Again, I'm thinking of her as like water spirit, surrounded by water, even though she's inside. No, she's one of the flowers, right? There's all the other water lilies and there's her in the middle right she's not uh she's not um the 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 water spirit she's like the queen water lily right i mean of course it just it's so good it works so well um and um and think about uh what that means for tom's rushing home with water lilies right i had an errand there gathering water lilies um uh, to pre to please his pr his pretty lady, I this is my favorite part of it. Right when we think it through, like so, what is that? His gathering water lilies for her is not just like, hey, to remind you of home, right? You're a water spirit. I took you away from your mom, the water. You moved in with me up here on dry land in the hills. So I'm gonna fill pots of water and I'm going to bring water lilies to make you feel like you're in a watery place. No, think about that. Tom going down to the river to gather water lilies and carry them back home to his house. It's not merely a gift for his wife. It's a recapitulation of his marriage, right? He's bringing Goldberry home again every time he goes down to the river and comes home with water lilies. I was just like, oh man, it's so beautiful. It is so perfect. Exactly, Gilgunthir. Tom's even more of a romantic than we thought he was. He's actually like reenacting his wedding on like a daily basis for millennia. I mean, man, how wonderful is that? Um, so anyway, I just, yeah, this was, uh, this was like my favorite thing, Irinda. So thank you for your post. That was really, really wonderful. Um, and, uh, yeah. Oh, and that's interesting. Tom is, uh, pointing out that, um, uh, the, the botanical name of water lilies is Nymphakia, uh, and which explicitly describes them as nymph-like, um, uh, since the word for nymph and water lily are connected in Greek, which is really cool, right? That's, uh, that's neat. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, good, good. Yeah, Tungo was bringing that up there as well. Right, good. So anyway, um, uh, it, it's just, uh, so yeah, yeah, this was just like, that was so, I mean, this was just a light bulb moment for me. So thanks. And again, it's just one of those things, like as soon as you look at it and, and it, you know, it's, this is to me so just it's so exciting. This is like what keeps me coming back to like literary interpretation, right? Uh, because, um, I find this, this kind of moment, right? When you can take a new reading, like a new idea like this. And as soon as you put it into contact with all of the rest of the things, it just, it makes everything make so much more sense. I mean, it's not just that it's a better explanation of that one thing, right? Like that is of Goldberry's identity. And I mean, it's not just the whole thing like, oh yeah, now green dress, yellow hair, all that stuff. You know, it's not just that, right? But the way that it just illumines, like it just lights up Tom. Right. And his actions. Why is the dude so obsessed with bringing water lilies and not just plants? Right. Not just reeds, not just not just uh, not just not just water. Right. But water lilies specifically. Why is he always doing the that? With the, I mean, OK, she likes water lilies. That's fine. Anyway, it's. um. Uh, it's just lovely. Right. Just lovely. So anyway. So thank you for that. That was that was 
just, I learned so much. That was spectacular. You have revolutionized my understanding of this whole thing. Now, let's go ahead and talk about, um, uh, talk about, talk about Tom. Bombadil, that is. Um, <laughs> not Hillman, <laughs> who I was just referring to a minute back. Um, okay, all right. The hobbits sat down gladly in low, rush-seated chairs while Goldberry busied herself about the table, and their eyes followed her for the slender grace of her movement filled them with quiet delight. See, look, there again! Right, like now when I'm thinking of, 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 of reeds by the, by the pool, right? And, I, I mean, of course, slender grace. From somewhere behind the house came the sound of singing. Every now and again they caught, among many a dairy doll and a merry doll and a ring-a-ding dillo, the repeated words, Old Tom Bombadil is a merry fellow, bright blue his jacket is, and his boots are yellow. Fair lady, said Frodo again after a while, tell me if my asking does not seem foolish. Who is Tom Bombadil? He is, said Goldberry, staying her swift movements and smiling. Frodo looked at her questioningly. He is, as you have seen him, she said in answer to his look. He is the master of the wood, water, and hill. The master of wood, water, and hill. Okay. Um, first, top part. Um, Tom's singing. Thinking about Tom's song, right... Um, not just these two lines, but the overall sort of trend of Tom's singing so far, right? Um, what, how do we understand this? Or to ask the same question a different way. Why does Tom sing about the color of his clothing, right? Outside of Tom Bombadil, that's not a very common topic of poetic composition, generally. Right? Um, oh, Freda, I'm glad that you brought that up. Freda is, uh, you know, pointing to, like, the way in which in some ways, you know, in some contexts, this sentence about, like, their eyes following her and being filled with quiet delight at the sight of her movements could seem a little sketchy, right? Uh, or be, you know, be kind of taken in a sort of an uncomfortable way. It's one of the things that I really love, actually, about that, is this whole, the sense of the innocence of that, right? I love the fact that we get that description without a hint of salaciousness, right? I mean, I, 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 I believe that that sentence is 100% sexual innuendo-free, Right, um, that the four hobbits are watching her move and delighting in her movements, without a, a bit of prurient intent. Right, um, and that seems to me a really essential part of what um, of what uh, we see happening to them and with them in this scene. Right, um, but uh, anyway, okay. Tom Bombadil singing about his clothes, right? <laughs> JJ points out it's fairly common in children's songs uh, that are oriented towards learning colors. Yes, that's true, I suppose. Uh, you do get, um, um, yeah, and, and Marianne, you're right. What delights them is the grace of her movements, right? It's, it's, it's her grace, as you say, that fills them with delight. Um, and it is it is as innocent as the pleasure, exactly like the pleasure that you would take in sitting quietly by the side of a river, watching the trees swaying in the breeze, or the reeds swaying back and forth in the breeze, right? Or the you know the water sort of swirling and playing as just to watch the movement of these things, uh, and you know, the, the, the grace of their movements, which is so unlike human movement, you know, most times. Um, yeah, that's, that's sort of the quality of it, right? Um, now, coming back to the, the, the clothing colors, right? Um, 
Uh, Julia points out that, you know, she always thought that Tom is just taking joy in his surroundings like a child would. Um, yes, I, 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 I do think that that's one of the things, right? There is a childlike nature to Tom Bombadil, which you have to... The dignified... Tom is not proud, right? Um, Tom does not do anything to try to protect any sense of his own dignity, right? And I think... I don't know. I want to be careful because I don't want to step on anybody's toes. Uh, But I kind of want to say there's something in Tom Bombadil that's almost like a litmus test for the pride or self-conceit of the reader, right? That is to say, like... If Tom Bombadil just kind of annoys you, right, and you get irritated at this guy who doesn't seem to take himself or anything else very seriously, maybe, maybe that's a hint that you take things a little too seriously and yourself a little too seriously, right? I mean, it's maybe. I'm just putting it out there. I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know, right? But maybe uh, we can see something kind of like that uh, happening. Um, and uh, Lady Shmabulak is pointing, of course, it's true, Tom Bombadil, the original, uh, you know, Tolkien said that the original uh, sort of concept of Tom Bombadil uh, was inspired uh, by one of his kids' dolls, which is true. But, but it's not like that's an explanation, right? Because just because it came from a children's toy doesn't mean that it has to be itself like a child, right? Or to, again, that, you know, that doesn't make it, inescapable, right, that he's going to be singing about uh, the color of his own clothing or something like that, right? So, um, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, uh, still thinking of that first point, but, but you know, Arthur, I, I can see the connection, really, between that and this. Um, Arthur's saying that innocence from evil can delight freely in beauty without being inappropriate. And in that moment, it's not to say that the hobbits are innocent of evil entirely or anything, but like this space, literally the space, you know, the physical space, as well as sort of the spiritual space that they are in, having entered into the house of Tom Bombadil and being his guests, it, it is like they are in that place, right? And they can take that delight without being inappropriate. And that's that same, that same kind of of innocent and childlike delight that we can see. Druid's Fire saying Tom and Goldberry um, are innocence personified. They are the youth of the world. Yes, I, I, I mean, I do think that there is the one, an, another word, uh, Druid's Fire, that I would want to add to that would be the word unspoiled, right? Not in the sense of like a spoiled child, um, but un, untainted, unmarred, right? Un, uncorrupted in any way. Um, there is a purity in the delight and in the merriment. You can't be as merry as they are uh, without being either like stupid slash naive or being innocent, right? Being actually um, uh, sort of outside that. Now, we're going to come back to this. The innocence, the, the sort of separation from evil of Tom and Goldberry. Um, hang on to that, because the interesting thing that we'll see, it's not like they have no experience of suffering or of evil. They're not ignorant. They know of these things. They've experienced loss. We know this. We will see this. Um, And yet, they remain with this air of, um, you know, sort of in this little, very little, realm of merriment and delight. Um, Yeah, so... um, Yeah, good, good. Um, oh, that's interesting. Uh, Al Ruran was just pointing out that uh, Tom Bombadil is, in this sense, almost like Saruman's polar opposite, right? Um, uh, yeah, uh, which he points out makes it interesting that uh, when Frodo and company returned to the Shire to deal with Saruman, Gandalf saw visiting Tom Bombadil, right? Um, yeah, well, you know. Aruron, I agree with you. The um, sort of the events of the scouring of the Shire do really sort of emphasize that. I mean, when when the two of them, Saruman and Tom Bombadil, become geographically juxtaposed, right, where you have Tom's little realm here and Saruman's 
you know, little realm that he's trying to make for himself there in the Shire, when those two things are geographically butting up against each other, the uh, the contrast is very clear, right? And again, thinking about the term unspoiled that I was just using, right? It's spoiling is exactly what Saruman is trying to do to the Shire, right? He's trying to spoil it. Um, and um, he's, uh, um, he's not... Uh, He's not able to finally do it, but uh, again, very, very, uh, very different. Um, yeah. Um, let's see. Gosh, sorry. So many, so many comments, and I can't talk about them all. Um, good. Good. Um, uh, Matt was initiating a little discussion about um, the unnaturalness of the colors, and Matt, that's always struck me as well. Like, why bright blue and yellow? Right? It's not that those are un totally unnatural colors in the sense of not found in nature at all, right? Um, I mean, they're found in nature. Uh, you know, we've seen lots of yellow with goldberry, right? And and uh, and bright blue is, you know could be the sky, right, could be associated with the water, so, um, and there are plenty of blight, bright blue flowers, and oh, hang on, I'm forgetting. What colors? Is Tom wearing the blue feather in his cap? I keep forgetting, Tom's, I guess this is, uh, I've been reading too much, uh, History of Middle-Earth, and also Adventures of Tom Bombadil, the poetry collection from later on, his, his, the, color in his hat. The feather in his hat keeps changing. It's a white plume. At some point, it's a blue plume. I forget how it is in the published text. Um, yes, Tom, I was thinking of the forget-me-nots, specifically. Um, aren't his eyes compared to bright blue forget-me-nots? Isn't that, if, if I'm remembering correctly? Um, blue feather. Right, he does have a blue feather stuck in there. Okay, that's what I, I thought. I thought in the published Fellowship of the, Ring, Fellowship of the Ring, it's a blue feather. Right. Um, okay. And then he gets a new feather in uh, uh, Tom Goes Boating. In uh, or Tom Bombadil Goes goes Boating in uh, in The Adventures of Tom Bombadil. Um, okay, anyway. So yeah, again, so it's not that the colors are are totally um, uh, are totally unnatural uh, in in a in a in a sort of literal or, or kind of extreme sense, but yet it's still striking, right? I mean. He does, it's not like he blends in, right? Goldberry looks like a water lily, right? Uh, uh, which again, I can I, I'll never unsee that now. Um, but um, I, but he doesn't. Um, yeah, uh, Huey, exactly. Um, that you know, he was pointing out how these are like prime colors, right? That there's there's a, uh, that there's a kind of purity to the colors. Um, You can say, Tony, as you're suggesting, that uh, um, he has no fear, right? So it's not like he needs camouflage or anything. Um, but, uh, yeah. Julia, I have no idea what Tom Bombadil's boots are made out of, right? I mean, I'm sure. I mean, admit it. Think about it. Unconsciously, when he's talking about his bright yellow boots, you're imagining rubber boots, aren't you? I mean, I am. I can't, when I imagine bright yellow boots, like, I'm imagining, I catch myself. If I'm not careful, very careful, I catch myself imagining rubber boots, right? But he can't have rubber boots. So, how does he get yellow boots? I mean, if you don't have rubber, then, like, how are you going to make bright yellow boots? Um, uh... Freya, I'm pretty sure that the bright blue feather in his hat is the tail feather of a kingfisher. That's where that's where he gets it. I only say that because um, he um, uh, he talks to the kingfisher. He has a he has an exchange about this with the king with the kingfisher uh, in uh, Bombadil Goes Boating, the the sort of sequel poem to the Adventures of Tom Bombadil that Tolkien wrote in the 1960s. Um, but um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, um, 
Eruheb is chiding me and saying, Tom's the master. Who am I to say he can't have rubber, right? Oh, okay. Maybe. Uh, no, no, I'm going to go ahead and say he doesn't have rubber. I, I, I can't imagine, uh, even if Tom Bombadil is master and uh, therefore, you know, India rubber trees grow in the old forest because he wants them. Um, I refuse to believe that uh, he uh, uh, participates in the process of refining rubber. Um, uh, but, but anyway, back to the colors. Tom is about not just the colors, but his singing about the colors, right? To me, it's like the fact that Tom not only is merry and sings merry songs, but that he's always singing about merriment, right? Um, part of the um, part of the joy of his um, uh, of his song, right? Of the content of his song is talking about joy, is is pointing out, is reenacting is broadcasting the joy that he's undergoing and inviting others to join in, right? Remember the vagueness of his um, address, right? Not his street address. But, uh, you know, remember in his poetry we were talking about, like, who's he talking to here? Is this, are these lines directed at Goldberry? Are they directed at the Hobbits? Are they just directed at anything within earshot? Um but that even that very ambiguity seems to me like a very um, characteristic thing, right? Um, like the answer is kind of all of the above, in a sense, right? It's what Tom does again. It's not just to be merry, but to 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 talk about merriment uh, and to emphasize the. So yeah, he's um, he's high profile, right? Um, He's, uh, 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 he's, uh, you know, it's like if you're happy and you know it, sing about it, right? And make sure everybody else knows it, too, is kind of where, uh, um, where, where he seems to, where he seems to live. JJ asks if, uh, if Tom himself is a spirit of joy as Goldberry is a spirit of water plants. Um, that's really interesting, right? Um, uh, Tolkien never says where Tom Bombadil would fit in, like, the Silmarillion mythology, right? But, um, uh, you know what I would do, J.J.? Uh, if in the Silm Film Project we ever get to specifying anything like this, do you know what I would want to say? Um, do you know which one of the Valar I would want to associate him with? I would want to associate him with Nienna, actually. Um, which might seem inappropriate, but I don't think so, right? Um, I could see him as one of the people of Nienna, one of the sort of offspring of Nienna, in a sense, um, it, like Goldberry being a daughter of the river, right? Um, anyway, I, I, I would, uh, I'd be really interested to kind of explore conceptually, uh, the connection between the kind of joy and contentment that Tom Bombadil has and shows, uh, and the kind of, uh, grief and mourning and wisdom that Nana shows. But, anyway, um, yeah. Yeah, good. Um, Oakwig expected me to say Tolkas. I, you know, I could see that too, but I don't think so. I, 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 Nana, I, I'd like to, I'd like to get, and, uh, JJ says it'd also be a good reason why, uh, Gandalf wants to go and have a long talk with Tom Bombadil, right? Yeah, maybe they met over in, uh, Nienna's house. No, Tom Bombadil was already here. Um, but, um, Anyway, yeah. Okay. Um, let's, let's go on to the part of this slide that uh, uh, that I wanted to chiefly focus on, of course. Uh, now that the preamble is done. Um, tell me if my asking does not seem foolish. 
who is Tom Bombadil? He is. And then when he questions that, when he looks, you know, questioningly at this, um, he is as you have seen him, she said in answer to his look. He is the master of wood, water, and hill. Um, let's, um, so let's think about this. This, of course, has, this is the passage more than any other, um, no, not more than any other. This passage is exclusively responsible for the theory. There's always been in, I've mentioned before, um, since I started my podcast, there are three questions I have gotten more consistently than any other questions out there. Right. Do Balrogs have wings? Um, are goblins and orcs the same thing? And who is Tom Bombadil? Those are the three questions I have gotten most ever since I started my podcast. Um, uh, less the do Balrogs have wings. I got that a lot in the first few years, uh, uh, and I've been trying to make some headway into uh, quashing that because it's in the end not really a very good question. But um, uh, anyway, uh, there's uh, in the answer, to, you know, in the sort of you know reader, the readerly world, uh, one of the major sort of subcurrents, one of the one of the one of the common theories about Tom Bombadil, is that he is a Luvatar, um, uh, that he's Iluvatar himself, right? That this that he's 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 God basically, um, and I. Um, I have to admit, it's a really fun idea. I, I totally wish it were true, actually. I really do. I really do. It would be true. Just as I would totally acknowledge, Amethorn, that Balrogs look way cooler with wings. That also I acknowledge. Like, there is no, I've never had any doubt in my mind why most visual artists cannot resist drawing wings on Balrogs, because it looks awesome. Um, but... Um, but anyway, I, I love the idea. Love the idea that Tom Bombadil is actually Eru, right? It's, uh, it is, um, um, that is a, 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 that is to me a very delightful concept. But it's, it's, it's not true. Um, that's, uh, yeah, yeah. T Hang on, pause again. Tom Hillman, that's exactly what I was thinking. Tom Hillman says, uh, Tom Bombadil is from this place, and they passed in thought out of out to regions where pain and delight flow together, and tears are the very wine of blessedness. Uh, yeah, that's how he fits with Nienna. That's exactly it's exactly the passage I was thinking of, Tom. Um, but um, uh, yeah. Anyway, so so it, I, again, love the idea. Um, I would be delighted to learn that Tom Bombadil was actually. Uh, Eru, but he's not. But so that line is from the Field of Cormallon, by the way, um, when they're uh, weeping and laughing at the same time as they listen to the song of Frodo of the Nine Fingers and the Ring of Doom. Um, uh, so anyway, um, okay. But it's totally, it's clearly not the case. That enti The entire argument for Tom Bombadil being a Luvatar is based on that one that he is. Uh, and th many people have interpreted that, have connected that, um, with the name of God, you know, with the I am that I am of Exodus, um, you know, the, 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 the identification of God. Um, and that's, uh, f that happened in Tolkien's lifetime even, and he actually uh, responded to that. Um, and I, I mentioned last time I wanted to look at this, so let's, uh, well, yeah, let's just do that. I'll come back to this. Um, this is Tolkien talking about this passage in Letter 153. But Goldberry and Tom are referring to the mystery of names. That is when Goldberry says he is. See and ponder Tom's words. Now we're going to get to Tom's words, where Tom Bombadil addresses the same question in a similar way uh, to Goldberry. Um, so Tolkien goes on. So we'll, we'll come back to that a little bit when we get to that passage. You may be able to conceive of your unique relation to the Creator without a name. Can you? For in such a relation, pronouns become proper nouns. That is like, how do you answer that question about anybody? Like, who are you exactly? Um, you are yourself, right? I mean, how can you how can you define that? But as soon as you are in a world of other finites with a similar, if each unique and different relation to the prime being, who are you? 
Frodo has asked not, what is Tom Bombadil, but who is he? We, we and he no doubt often laxly confuse the questions. Goldberry gives what I think the correct answer. We need not go into the sublimities of I am that am, which is quite different from he is. She adds, a conce- she adds as a concession a statement of part of the what. He is master in a peculiar way. He has no fear and no desire of possession or domination at all. He merely knows and understands about such things as concern him in his natural little realm. He hardly even judges, and as far as can be seen, makes no effort to reform or even remove or remove even the willow. Um, yes, uh, Tom, the, the, the quote from Tom Bombadil that he's referring to at the beginning is when Tom Bombadil asks him back, who are you alone, yourself, and nameless, right? So a few of you were talking about this passage, on not, not just the passage in the text, but Tolkien's response to this passage, um, and finding it a little bit... Uh, kind of disappointing or 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 uh unsatisfying in some in some ways um but um let me I, so i want to talk about it a little more but before we do i want to do a little meta reading here right a little meta criticism that is a little close reading of tolkien's reading of his own text here um I want to point out how Tolkien answers this question, like how he addresses this question. This is one of the things that I love so much about Tolkien's reaction to his books. Um, And one of the reasons why I like to hear Tolkien talk about The Lord of the Rings so much more than I like to hear so many other modern authors talking about their own works, when he is asked this question, what is Tom Bombadil and Goldberg? What does it mean when she says he is? He does not go off and give like an ex cathedra answer, right? He doesn't be like, since I am the author and the owner of the whole story, let me tell you what was really behind that, right? That's almost never how he approaches this question. How he almost invariably approaches questions like this is for himself to go back and do a close reading of the text, right? Um, he, he doesn't say, like, no, 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 I didn't mean it to be God. That's not the correct answer. Right? That's not what he says. What he says is, no, no, if you read carefully, she says he is. And if you think about it, he is is very different from I am that am, right? You know, the, from the name of God. Like, when you look at what God was saying about himself in giving that particular name, um, you know, and, and the, the sort of the, the, as he said, the sublimities, right? The, the very kind of profound um, sort of paradox uh, and sort of essence of that concept of the, you know, I am that I am. Um, and he's saying you know, it's not, it's very different from what Goldberry says. Okay, so he's just like, read the text carefully. Let's read the text carefully together and draw conclusions about what it says. That is always what he does, and I love it. Um, yes, exactly, Tony. He approaches it as a scholar reading a received text, not as an author speaking with authority about it and sort of laying down new canon as he responds to it. Instead, I get that sense that Tolkien gives in his letters always of like, hey, you have a question about the book? I'm going to like come alongside you and the two of us will sit shoulder to shoulder and look at the text together and see what it says, right? I love that. Um, and I have uh, long been feeling that... Um, uh, that that's uh, really the best and most constructive approach for an author to take about uh, their books. Um, but anyway, okay. Um, uh, so, um, yeah, exactly, Mary. And it is in the same spirit as when, you know, he answers a question, we'll say, like, I don't know, or like, I, you know, and or, or, you know, talk about needing to find out or that he never discovered the answer to that question and stuff. Yeah. And, and that even gets into some different stuff. But uh, anyway, um, oops, darn it, I went AFK without noticing there. Um, uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, anyway, okay, so... What is Goldberry talking? So the, 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 the key thing that... Um, that Tolkien points out here is that we and Frodo both make an understandable mistake. And that is to mistake the question of who is he for the question, what is he? Right. Um, and, um, I, I, 
This is one reason that I think that a lot of people find, again, not only this passage, but Tolkien's reading of this passage a little unsatisfactory. Because the question that so many people want answered is, what is Tom Bombadil, right? And all Tolkien does is point out, that's not the question that was asked. That's not the question that Goldberry is answering, right? It may even have been what Frodo meant. And it may be why he finds her answer puzzling or unsatisfying. Frodo does, right? Because what he's what he has in mind, what he really wants to know is what is Tom Moppet? What is he, right? Um, how, where does he fit in the world? How do I put him, fit him into you know like this whole my world view, right? Um, but it's but the thing is, it's not the question he actually asks. And Goldberry takes him up on the question that he asks: Who is Tom Bombadil? He is. He is. He is. And then she, when she clarifies, she says, he is as you have seen him. I mean, he's not, he's not, I mean, and, and also you think about that. It's like, Tom Bombadil, seriously? Is he hiding anything? Right? Did, is there, do you think there's like parts of his character that he's not revealing, right? Is he, is, is, is he a little too shy and soft-spoken for you, right? You, you feel the need to kind of draw Tom Bombadil out to express a little bit more clearly who he is, right? Come on. Like, did you, did you, did, didn't you hear his name? Right? I mean, any of the times that he said it, right? Come on now. Um, it's, um, it's, uh, yeah, exactly. He's uh, uh, Julia. He's not got a secret personality that he's hiding behind his cheery demeanor. Um, he's uh, he's he he is himself, right? And then so as Tolkien described it as a concession, and it that's exactly how it reads, right? When she says he is the master of wood, water, and hill, um, she goes on basically to say. I answered the question you asked. It might not have been a very good answer, but that's because it wasn't a very good question, right? If you want to know what he is, I'll go on and tell you a little bit more about him, right? Um, this doesn't answer the who is he question, but he is the master of wood, water, and hill. But pause for a second. Um, think how interesting it is that to Goldberry, that's not a direct answer to the question. Think about this another way. Um, again, some people find it unsatisfying, the answer that he, she gives, or that Tolkien gives, because um, they want a straight answer to the hard question of what is he, right? But um, think about the implications of the fact that Goldberry's first answer is not, he is the master of wood, water, and hill. Let me... Uh, I don't know. I'm hesitant to make this reference because not everybody's going to get it. It's a Bible reference, so not everybody's going to get it. Um, but bear with me for a second. Um, it reminded me, the passage that I kept thinking of when I was thinking about this passage um, is in the Old Testament, the story of David and Goliath, which lots of people know about, right? Um, and the thing to remember from the Bible story is that Saul, who is the king of Israel, has met David before. David has come and played his harp for him and everything, so he knows David. He's acquainted with David, right? After he becomes acquainted with David, David comes and does the Goliath thing, right? He comes to the camp, and there's Goliath out there, and he's like, I can take him, and Saul's like, okay, whatever, and David goes out, and he takes a little sling, and he whips Goliath in the head, and Goliath falls over, and then David jumps up on him and decapitates him, which most, that usually gets left out of the Sunday school version of the story, but um, it doesn't work so well on a flannel graph, I know, but anyhow, uh, that's, so, okay, so that, but, but the, here's the interesting thing, part to me, and the part that I was remembering when I came to this, Saul's reaction, King Saul's reaction, when David kills Goliath and then picks up Goliath's sword and decapitates the giant, his reaction is he says to like one of his uh, one of his underlings, he says, "Who is he? That boy? Who is he?" And he's not asking like, "What's his name?" Like, "Hey, who is that fine boy who is apparently a good?" He knows the answer. Right? He knows he's David son of Jesse. He knows he's David son of Jesse. He's already met him before. But uh but his response when David kills when he sees David kill the giant, he says, Whoa, who is he? 
it's obvious he means something more, right? Um, and from that point on, King Saul is all suspicious. This is when he shifts from like, you know, I am like David's mentor to like, I'm, I'm afraid that David is going to supplant me as king, which in his defense, David totally is going to supplant him as king, right? Um, but, um, but anyway, it, it's, I think about what Saul meant by that question in that instance, right? Okay, who is he really, right? Um, that implication of his identity, right? His identity is like, he is something important. So again, I come back to Goldberry now. She says he is the master of wood, water, and hill. That's like the kind of answer to the question that Saul was wanting, right? That's kind of what Saul meant. Like, hang on, is he... He's not just a kid who can play the harp kind of well, right? He's not just like that, what, seventh son? I think seventh son of Jesse, right? Um, runt of the litter. He's not just uh, He's not just that, right? He's not just David, son of Jesse. He's someone, capital S, right? He's a big deal. He is, uh, oops, in fact, God's future anointed, right? Again, that's what he's kind of sensing. In other words, again, to say, Who is Tom Bombadil? Oh, right, yeah. He's master of wood, water, and hill. That's who he is, right? I mean, it's like, the answer to that question for us is like, what do you put on your business cards, right? Um, You know, I mean, I I even, it makes me think of, um, of people that I know around the town that I live in, right? Like, I, I mean, as several of you know from the injuries I've had to report, uh, I study karate. And so, like, the people in my karate class have no idea what I do for a living. No, no idea what. A couple of them have uh, sort of asked me and found out, you know, that I'd, like, am this, like, online tol- talking guy, right? Um, or, you know, president of Signum University. Like, if they ask, we, we'll end up talking about who it... But, like, you know, so there's this sense of, like, you know, like, they know who I am, but they don't know who I am, right? They don't know, like, you know, that thing about me. But this is what I think is so interesting about Goldberry's. She's not, she doesn't present his resume, right? That's, to her, that's not the answer to the question. The answer to who is he is not like, oh, well, let me tell you about Tom Bombadil, right? Let me give you his resume. Let me show you his business card, right? Do you understand who Tom Bombadil is, right? Um... That is exactly the kind of personal dignity on which Tom Bombadil is never going to... It's irrelevant to him. What is the answer to the question? He is, right? Um, uh, and, you know, and, 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 and when she expands on that, her, her, her expanse is not like, oh, of course you realize how important he is, at least around here, right? No, her response is, he is as you have seen him, right? This... this You've seen, you, you, you know the answer to this question, right? Um, and the further answer is that what she goes on to say is not the big review. It's not the answer, right? It is, in Tolkien's sense, a concession. Like, she consents. This is the kind of thing that Frodo's actually getting at when he's asking that question. But the point that, um, but the point that uh, Goldberry and Tolkien are making there is that isn't the real answer to the question you know the the and uh and and it's kind of calling us on the kind of baggage that we attach to the question who are you but but who are you right <laughs> that you know he's saying you know it's not uh, it's not about that um Julia, exactly. Tom Bombadil's own response is, don't you know my name yet? That's the only answer, he says. Um, exactly. And we'll get back to, um, uh, we'll, we'll, of course, look at his response uh, a little bit more. And that is how he, what he's going to segue to it. You know, so his own, he has the same response as Goldberry, essentially, but then he goes on and adds some kind of different things. Well, okay. Um, so this is good. And we're at risk of uh, only doing one slide tonight. <laughs> Which might, which would possibly be a new low. Um, let's go on to uh, look at her clarification on what it means um, to um, to say that uh, he's master, right? She just said he's master of water, wood, and hill. Um, then all this strange land belongs to him? Frodo asks. 
No, indeed, she answered, and her smile faded. That would indeed be a burden, she added in a low voice, as if to herself. The trees and the grasses and all things growing or living in the land belong each to themselves. Tom Bombadil is the master. No one has ever caught old Tom walking in the forest, wading in the water, leaping on the hilltops under light and shadow. He has no fear. Tom Bombadil is master. Notice how Goldberry has broken into Tom Bombadil meter in talking about him, right? Uh... No one has ever caught old Tom walking in the forest, wading in the water, leaping on the hilltops under light and shadow. That's that's the verse, right? You hear it? You hear the the, the you can hear the trochaic heptameter lingering behind her lines there, right? Um, he has no fear. Tom Bombadil is master. Um, uh, yes. Um, uh, Lady Shmebiwak, you're right. It is interesting that she says it would be a burden. I love how she says that in a low voice as if to herself, right? Um, the the assumption and kind of counter-assumption of Frodo and Goldberry, the kind of cross-purposes at which they're speaking here, is really interesting to me, right? Um, Frodo assumes he is master means ownership. Master, like, that's what it means, right? Mastery means ownership. If you're the master, you're the boss, right? See, Jonathan, this is where I come back to uh, Virgil, right? I think that Virgil's farmer in the eclogues, right, would be about ownership, right? This is his, the free, you know, the free holding of a free citizen, right? That's that's kind of, as I understand it, I've not read Virgil's eclogues in a long time, but uh, but as I recall, that's the, and Tom, of course, can Tom Hillman can correct me if I'm wrong about this, um, but that's the kind of thing that he's describing there. Um, and, uh, and, and that's really more like what Frodo is kind of assuming is involved in the whole mastery equation, right? But, um, uh, but that's not what she means at all. And not only is that not what she means, she's unpleasantly surprised, right? Unpleasantly surprised by the concept. No, indeed, belongs to him. No, indeed. And it's not just that she, her smile fades, like, I disapprove now. Like, like, you know, thanks for being a buskill, Frodo. We had some merriment going on there, and now you've really brought us all down with that little faux pas there, right? But it's not just that. That would indeed be a burden, she added in a low voice as if to her. It's like she's trying to process the concept, is how I read that, right? Like, belongs to him? Like, whoa. Goldberry's reaction is like, I never thought of that. That's a horrifying idea. No way. No, 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 no. That's not what master means at all. Um, uh, everything belongs to itself. To be master of something else isn't to own it. And again, coming back to uh, Tom and Goldberry as, you know, as, as, as joy, as delight, as innocence, you know, um, as we were discussing earlier, <clears throat> notice how firmly she rejects the idea of dominion, right? Dominating another thing. Tom is unquestionably the master, but it doesn't mean dominating other things. And remember, as Tolkien himself, you know, look back at Tolkien's own reading of that, right? Um, He is master in a peculiar way. He has no fear and no desire of possession or domination at all, right? And we see, again, notice... Tolkien this is not Tolkien decreeing this, right, or adding this to the text. He's he's interpreting that. He's reading the text. Um, notice how it corresponds to exactly what Goldberry says, because he's reading the text and commenting on it, right? Um, he merely knows and understands about such things as concern him in his natural realm. He hardly even judges, and as far as can be seen, makes no effort to reform or remove even the willow, right? We can see that mastery does not mean domination at all. We can see what that means to Tom, right? Um, He doesn't approve of how Old Man Willow acts, right? But he's not going to assert his will over Old Man Willow even, right? To compel the Willow to conform to his, Tom's 
preferred approach, right? Um, mastery doesn't mean that to Tom Bombadil. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, now, James asks a really interesting question. James Stephen says, How does Tom being master but not owner relate to him having his domain and not setting foot out of it. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, I'm not sure. haven't thought about that uh, particular connection. To me, it's mostly about his remaining within his area you know, his sort of self-appointed boundaries there, seems to me mostly about contentment is the main thing I would say about that, right? Um, he has everything he wants and needs there. He is completely happy and completely content. Um, why would he go elsewhere, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, exactly, Jonathan. His domain is self-imposed. That's the important thing to remember. It's not that his power is limited. I mean, it is. It's not infinite, right? But um, but again, it's not like the boundaries have been set from the outside. They're set, they're set by him. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Well, Fred, the traditional sense of the word master, I mean, the words that correspond with master, right? Like, the other half of the master equation would be words like servant, slave, student, right? Masters and students as well. But it is a very hierarchical word. And that's why Tolkien says he's master in a peculiar way. By calling it peculiar, Tolkien is acknowledging that this sort of Bombadilian sense of mastery is not normal, right? He's not appealing to a different, a sort of established but perhaps archaic mode or something like that. It's not. There's not an archaic precedent for this kind of mastery. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Yeah. Yeah, Julia says, or uh, like the way that people like say, uh, young master Bombadil, right? Well, the young master, though, but that's a servant thing, right? Because the young master is the child who is the, you know, the child of the aristocrat, like right? the, the child of the landowner. Um, if. Uh, if other kids were called young master, it was metaphorical, right? That that um, only the ch the children of aristocrats and landed gentry are really young master. Um, but uh, let's see, JJ's talking about master craftsman. Yes, there is that sense of mastery. Um, there's that sense of mastery to achieve mastery over something but even that is not really the Bombadilian sense of mastery right it's not like he has um, yeah okay Marianne I can see that Marianne is saying you know we master a skill not because we achieve dominance over it but because we understand it right as our as our understanding of something comes closer to it, perfection to completeness of understanding right then we you know might say that we have achieved mastery uh, over something um, yes and I agree. I mean, so that connection with understanding is interesting, Marianne, especially, of course, in light of Tolkien's own explanation of that. But, but I'm not sure. That is to say, I'm not sure that I'm convinced that that's a, a full kind of explanation of Tom Bombadil's usage of it. 
um, uh, because it's not a skill, right? I mean, the trees and the grasses and all things growing or living in the land belong each to themselves. Tom Bombadil is the master. Um, he is the master. Like, so he is master to the trees, grasses, and all things growing or living in the land, right? They belong to themselves. For them to, for Tom to own them would be a burden. He doesn't own them, but he's master over them. So, I don't think, I mean, you can't master trees and grasses and all things growing or living in the same way that you can master a skill. But I do, I do value that connection with understanding, and that does seem to be involved. I mean, understanding obviously is involved by Tolkien's own reading. Um, but, uh, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, uh, Charles is saying, is he master in the sense of leader? Uh, so he's not quite responsible for the land in the sense of ownership, uh, which would require keeping them in line. Right, exactly. Um, I don't know. Leader even seems a little proactive for, for Tom, doesn't it? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean... This is going to sound unsatisfying, right? But I'm not sure that the very conversation that we're having now isn't kind of the point, right? That is to say, we don't have any experience. None of us have any experience with the concept of mastery completely divorced from the concept of domination, right? Everyone who is master of any one or anything else, right? There is no matter how benevolent and generous and kind you may be, there is still an element of dominance, right? That element of either of outright ownership or of like I'm the boss or you should do what I say, right? Because I'm the master. Um, whether that means because I'm your teacher and so you should do what I say because I'm the teacher and you're the student, or whether it's um, you know in a in a, a sort of a political hierarchy sense, right? Um, but uh, I think what Goldberry and Tolkien are inviting us to do here, what she's clearly inviting the hobbits to do, since it's plain that Frodo doesn't understand it any more than we do, right? Uh, to him, mastery equals ownership, right? That's what he assumes. Um, so they, too, are trying to wrap their brains around the, the concept. What does mastery without dominion look like? Um, answer... <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, the answer is uh, uh, red jacket, yellow boots. Right? I mean, it's just that, like, he is as you've seen him, right? Um, and Tolkien famously resisted going into too much detail about Tom Bombadil, right? He refused to just give a straight up answer to the question uh, of what is Tom Bombadil. Right, he just he, he he wouldn't do it, and he even said, "I think there are some things that should kind of remain mysterious, and Tom Bombadil is one of those things." My question is, why, 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 why should Tom Bombadil remain mysterious when other things are not? Right? When Tolkien shows such an impulse to explain things and fit things together in so many other contexts, why is he so uh, loath to do that with Tom Bombadil? And my answer to that question. Um, how that makes sense to me, right? Um, the way in which I can fit Tolkien's reluctance to be more explicit about Tom Bombadil with everything else that he does and says is exactly this, that in Tom Bombadil, he is attempting to depict and capture something which is outside of our normal categories. He doesn't want to fit Tom into a niche because he doesn't fit into a niche. We don't have a... We don't have a... a, a, a you know, we don't have a hole to fit his peg in, right? Um, we just don't. 
and that's the point of him, right? The point of him is to expand this, right? The point of him is to get us to wrestle with this concept, to get us thinking about what would mastery without domination look like? Wouldn't that be, that would be kind of awesome, wouldn't it? What would it look like? Um, and that's why the only answer is he is as you have seen him, right? Um, and uh, so, uh, so yeah, I, I, I do think it's something. So, you know, Marianne was just talking about, in a sense, you know, perhaps what Tom Bombadil does is give us a glimpse of Arda unmarred, right? Uh, Arda prior to being marred. We can't even understand, right, what... It's hard for us really to imagine what an unfallen world would look like um, because all of the, the every framework and assumption we have about how things work in the real world, right, is based on Arda Mard, right, is based on a fallen world. Um, so, no, Tom Bombadil doesn't fit in there and Tolkien's not going to pigeonhole him. Um, but uh, he is, so it's good for Tom not for us not to become, we should not be able to be comfortable in answering that question. If we can just say, that's who, that's who and what Tom is, uh, it's simple, then we're getting it wrong, right? We're not, we're clearly not doing it right. Um, okay. Hey, I think we can probably do like one whole more slide, and I already did this one, so look at this. We're on slide number four now. We're going, we're going crazy. Um, a door opened and in came Tom Bombadil. He had now no hat, and his thick brown hair was crowned with autumn leaves. He laughed, and going to Goldberry, took her hand. "'Here's my pretty lady,' he said, bowing to the hobbits. "'Here's my Goldberry, clothed all in silver green, with flowers in her girdle. Is the table laden? I see yellow cream and honeycomb and white bread and butter, milk, cheese, and green herbs and ripe berries gathered. Is that enough for us? Is the supper ready?' "'It is,' said Goldberry. "'But the guests, perhaps, are not.' Um, so, by the way, can you hear it? Can you hear his verse, right? Here's my gold berry, clothed all in silver green, with flowers in her girdle. Is the table laden? I see yellow cream and honeycomb and white bread and butter, milk, cheese, and green herbs and ripe berries gathered. Is that enough for us? Is the supper ready? Trochaic heptameter, right? Um, anyway... I've mentioned that line, right? And I was quoting it when we were exploring, uh, when we were looking at uh, the House of Tom Bombadil uh, in the game world, right? Um, yellow cream and honeycomb and white bread and butter, milk, cheese and green herbs and ripe berries gathered. And you can see all those things on the tables in the game, right? They, they include all of it, uh, including the honeycomb, which I couldn't figure out when we were looking at it. Um, uh, that line is straight out of, as I've mentioned before, I believe, straight out of the original poem, The Adventures of Tom Bombadil, that was published in 1933. Yellow cream and honeycomb and white bread and butter, milk trees and green herbs and ripe berries gathered. Those two lines are straight out of the poem, and they are des a description of the wedding feast of Tom Bombadil and Goldberry. And Irindus, again, the idea of him bringing home water lilies not as just a gift for his wife, but a recapitulation of his marriage, right? Uh, and then, of course, what happens when they when they get there? The wedding feast is still being served, right? That's the kind of the you know the immortality of the moment uh, of their love of their wedding, right? Is uh, uh, so awesome, right? But um, anyway. Um, yeah, exactly, Julie. It's like it's like they eat their wedding cake every night. Exactly, exactly. Um, uh, Tony asks, are Tom and Goldberry vegetarian? They appear to be. Um, you know, are they vegetarian on principle? Do they do they never eat meat? Um, uh, I uh, uh, I mean, I don't know that they are vegetarians on principle. Uh, again, that's a direct quotation from the original poem. Um, Julia, I agree. It is a little hard to imagine Tom Bombadil killing and skinning things, right, uh, and roasting them. Um, that's a little hard to imagine. Um, if you think about it, well, okay, I was going to say the only thing in their entire... Uh, in the entire uh, uh, spread that involves doing violence to any kind of creatures, the green herbs, right? Those green herbs had to, had to, had to die, right, in order to be cut and and put on the table. Um, whereas the rest of it, yellow cream, honeycomb, 
uh, butter, milk, cheese, berries, you know, like no living creature was killed in the making of any of those things, right? But then I was white bread. No, you gotta, you gotta, you can't, um, you can't make bread without, uh, without hurting some plants along the way. That's totally, that's totally gotta happen. Well, the berries, no, but see, the berries don't, like, the bushes don't die. Right, I mean that to to, to to pluck and eat the fruit of the of the of the thing. That's totally that's totally cool, right? Uh, no uh, no violence need be done in order to gather berry uh, berries. Um, Tilly and they do grow beans on poles. Absolutely right, um, which is uh, which is interesting actually, right? Uh, interesting not only because of course they're 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 gonna they're gonna kill the bean plants, but also because they uh, they train them to grow on. On poles, right? They cultivate. They don't. It's not like they just pick them in the wild in their natural state, right? They train them and f- and compel them to grow in particular ways, right? Up the up the bean poles. Um, but um, anyway, uh, <clears throat> Irindus asks, where where do they get all the dairy from? No idea. I, we never see, right? We don't see a cow or a goat or a sheep. But there's lots of possibilities. It could be any one of those things, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, good. Um, O'Malley thinks they might import things from Farmer Maggot. It's possible. It's possible. Um, it's possible. Uh, yeah, Blue Wizard is asking, wouldn't the herbs be Goldberry's relatives? See, you know, this is why, um, especially in a Tolkien context, uh, it's, uh, um, don't forget, uh, when you're thinking about vegetarianism and thinking about that in the context of Tolkien's world, uh, don't forget, in the real world, when people, one of the reasons often that people will talk about why they're vegetarian is that they don't want to think about like killing and eating like killing things and then eating dead carcasses of things right but vegetarians kill and then eat the dead carcasses of plants right um so i've always felt it a little speciesist to make that particular argument and remember in tolkien in particular there's a particular sensitivity to the independent life of, uh, of plants. Remember, Goldberry specifically singles out the grasses and the trees as the things whose life each belongs to themselves, right? Um, so when you're eating plants, when you're, you know, you're, you're, t- 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 that's a living creature too, right? Um, but, um, uh, but you, now you add, I agree, you absolutely can pluck off some of the leaves or pick the fruit of plants without killing them, just as you can, uh, as you can have yellow cream and honeycomb and milk and cheese and ripe berries without killing anybody. Right. Agreed. Um, but there are many things that uh, a vegetarian would eat that you can't have without killing the plant and eating it. Um, anyway, uh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not I'm trying, I don't want to get into an argument about vegetarianism. Um, but, um, but it does strike me that there's, uh, there's very little is harmed in the making of their dinner here. Um, and that seems to me fitting. That seems to me interesting. Um, we don't see any of the, a kind of, uh, 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 predatory goings on here, uh, in the Bombadil, um, in the Bombadil household. Um, yeah, but Mungway, that's exactly what I was saying. You can't make bread without, without not only, not only killing plants, but, uh, uh, beating them rather savagely afterwards and then grinding them into bits, right? So in, in the making of flour, right? But um, uh, anyway, okay. Um, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, bees could be harmed by the stealing of their honey, but you, you can you can you you can harvest honey and honeycomb without without uh, uh, without uh, destroying bees or a bee colony. Um, but uh, yeah, good. Um, Okay. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> I'm now going to back slowly away from the vegetarianism question. Um, okay. Are we good? We're kind of good. Mm, okay, let's do one more. One more. 
Tom clapped his hands and cried. Tom, Tom. Now, when Tom, whenever Tom Bombadil uh, starts um, uh, starts a sentence like that, you've got to hear it right away, right? You know, just like old Tom Bombadil, that 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 spondaic beginning, you know, with the with the heart, several hard beats in a row, which is so characteristic of his poetic line, right? Whenever he starts a sentence like that, you hear it right away, right? Tom, Tom, your guests are tired and you had near forgotten. Come now, my merry friends, and Tom will refresh you. You shall clean grimy hands and wash your weary faces. Cast off your muddy cloaks and comb out your tangles. Hear it? Four perfect lines right there. Um, the only thing that it, that it doesn't do is rhyme. Literally the only difference between that speech and a quatrain of Tom's verse is rhyme. There, there's no rhyme here. Sometimes he will rhyme in his prose, right? But here he's not. Um, he's not. He's not. Rhy- uh, he's not rhyming. Um. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, he opened the door, and they followed him down a short passage and round a sharp turn. They came to a low room with a sloping roof, a penthouse it seemed, built to the north end of the house. Its walls were of clean stone, but they were mostly covered with green hanging mats and yellow curtains. The floor was flagged and strewn with fresh green rushes course it was. There were four deep mattresses, each piled with white blankets, laid on the floor along one side. Against the opposite wall was a long bench laden with wide earthenware basins, and beside it stood brown ewers filled with water, some cold, some steaming hot. There were soft green slippers set ready beside each bed. I totally want to stay at the Tom Bombadil Airbnb. Just, just saying. This sounds really. Uh, Tom is going to get an excellent TripAdvisor review uh, after this uh, particular piece of hospitality. But um, one of the things uh, that I that this passage makes me think of is in conjunction with some of the other things we were noticing about Tom Bombadil, in particular our sort of surprise um, at uh, at the. I was about to say domesticity, but that's not exactly it. The cultivation, right? The How civilized Tom Bombadil's house is. Um, how you might expect Tom Bombadil to be, like, at one with the wilderness, right? But he's not at one with the wilderness. Again, even this, uh, even this hospitality, right? Even this, uh, like, that he is smacking himself on the head for not remembering to refresh his guests. It would be refreshing to them to clean their hands and wash their faces, uh, cast off their muddy cloaks, and to comb their hair, right? To comb the tangles out of their hair. To be washed and brushed and clean, that's very civilized, right? Again, like, that's not very one with nature of you, right? Uh, I mean, like, what's wrong with dirt, right? What's wrong with mud? Isn't that, like, the natural state? But again, it's it's not about the natural state. It's not about, like, oneness with nature uh, in that in that kind of a sense. It's just not what we see with Tom. Even though, of course, Tom in his marriage is kind of one with nature in a, in a different sense, right? Um, but again, it's not... That's not what we see exactly, uh, uh, Tom. He's not Khan Buri Khan, right? That's not the kind of wild man that that uh, that 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 Tom is, it's very it's very civilized. That's very civilized, uh, Arthur. I agree. That's that's the word for that. That's a great word for it, and a surprising word for it, isn't it? Um, uh, several of you are expressing surprise that uh, hobbits wear slippers. Well, sure. Why wouldn't they wear slippers? Right? Just because their feet have natural leathery soles, that mean they don't have to wear shoes all the time. But, I mean, come on. There were soft green slippers set ready beside each bed, especially coming right after the description of the brown ewers filled with some with cold and some with steaming hot water, and then, like, the soft little slippers next to their beds. I mean, come on, how comfy does that sound, right? Why do hobbits wear slippers? For... Same reason everybody wears slippers, because they're comfy, right? Even you can have leathery soles to your feet and still find soft green slippers super comfy. Um, uh, yeah, so, um, so yeah, that's, that's, they don't wear them because they have to. They wear them because they can, right? <laughs> Who wouldn't want to? Um, uh, but anyway, so, um, yeah, Mungley, I agree. When he w- went on ahead to prepare things for them, clearly the, uh, the, uh, the, like, Manufacturer, you know, he had to whip up some some nice soft slippers for them. 
Um, yeah, but anyhow, uh, the pleasures of Tom Bombadil's house are civilized things that are familiar to them. And again, that's the thing that is to me makes uh, it just contributes to making Tom Bombadil and the ho- his house and his, the whole Bombadilian experience in these chapters so fascinating is that Tolkien does such an incredible job of not fitting it into any boxes, right? It is like the wild country, right? It is at one with the wild country in ways that the Shire is not, right? And yet, it's not wild. It's civilized. It's domesticated, right? It's like the Shire, and everything is cozy and 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 very very homelike for them, and yet alien at the same time, right? In some of the ways that we were talking about earlier on, um, so um, I. Uh, you know, I think that that's again part of the part of the point that again Tom Bombadil is all about, and the experience at Tom Bombadil's house is all about sort of uh, expanding our frontiers in this particular way, the sort of the frontiers of our own imagination uh, in this particular way. Um, okay, um, we will um, we will move on. Um, See maybe okay, Tony. I'll I'll answer your comment and then I'll and then I'll stop. Um, Tony is suggesting that it's 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 almost magical. They sort of get the house they expect. Brick Tales adds like a like a Tolkien esque or like a Hobbitish room of requirement, right? Um, uh, kind of, kind of, maybe in a sense. But see, I I don't. With a difference, with, with I think an important difference. Like in, in a way, yes. In a way, it's like that. But it's also unlike anything that they would expect. I mean, again, notice how Frodo's assumptions, like his whole worldview, is, you know, for that one brief moment, off-putting to Goldberry, right? And that, I think, is a big part of the point, right? Um, Not that they get what they wish for, right? That they get, you know, the, it's not, it's in that thing, we're talking about the witch house, right? And, uh, you know, sort of comparing and contrasting Tom Bombadil's house with uh, the house of witches in the middle of the forest in, in Grimm's fairy tales, right? Um, in this way, right, you know, the, um, right, JJ, you were just thinking the same thing. I, I didn't even see that. Um, uh, uh, Brick tells, I'm going to come back to your joke about the room of requirement, right? No, the thing that's more like the room of requirement is the candy house, right? Uh, the confectionery house in, ha- in Hansel and Gretel, right? Two children, starving children, remember. They're like in a famine. They haven't eaten in a long time. So what do they find? Like they come to a house in the middle of a clearing. What do they find? A house that is like made of delicious things, like the most delicious things to eat that they can think of, right? That's the kind of room of requirement thing, right? But that's exactly what the hobbits don't get. They don't get, like, and I have come into, you know, like, hobbit utopia. It's it's hobbitopia, right? In the middle of the thing. Like, that's, it's not like that. Um, it's like, it's kind of similar to that, uh, but it that's it's not in the same way, right? That isn't, in fact, what they find. Um, what they find is strange. Remember, it's like when you go to knock on a cottage door to ask for a drink of water and instead find the door answered uh, by a fair young elf queen quiet and living flowers. It's, it's, it's like that, of course. You know, remember that experience we can all relate to. Um, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree. Uh, uh, Tom has just said that uh, Hobbitopia would have beer. Yes, yes, they would serve beer at Hobbitopia. And Julia, they prob- there probably would be more mushrooms. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Or, 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 or bacon. Yeah, but people are imagining houses made out of bacon or of mushrooms or something like that. Exactly, right, yeah, you know... It, Lots of bacon, mushrooms, smoke rings, and or, you know, tobacco and beer. Right, that's what you would find uh, if uh, if this were uh, <laughs> if this were the the Hobbit version, right, of the Hansel and Gretel house. Um, uh, that's interesting, Tony. Tony says they get what they need, not what they want. Yeah, maybe so, maybe so. Um, but um, uh, you know, but that's um, 
again, that's part of the mystery, right? That's one of the reasons why Tom Bombadil and Tom Bombadil's house, why Tolkien refused to just peg it, right? To just say what it is. Because it's about evoking these ideas, many ideas, uh, on, on many different levels, right? This, it's a it's a concept, it's a way of life, it's a whole worldview, right? Tom Bombadil's house is a worldview unto its own, and you have to experience it, right? You can't just label it. Um, so, who is Tom Bombadil? He is, right? He is as you have seen him. That's why that's the answer, you see? All right. Um, let's, um, let's, uh, let's, let's move on. So, I'm gonna, we're going to end there tonight. Uh, made some excellent progress, I think, marching our way through Chapter 7 here. Uh, so thanks for that. We're going to have a field trip time now. Um, so thanks for uh, to those of you who are joining us on the field trip. We're on the Crick Hollow server tonight, uh, as I mentioned before. Um, uh, so, um, so thanks, everybody, for joining us. Say goodbye to our Twitter folks, as always. Um, come to uh, twitch.tv slash signamu uh, to follow along uh, with the, the game feed. Uh, if you'd like to. But thanks, everybody. Thanks, Marianne, for joining us. And we'll see you guys later. All right. And excellent. We will now head out. So um, I was planning to... I mean, the, I want to go up into Forakel. I want to I want to explore the north. Um, you may remember that last week, in, during our field trip... We were looking at Osferod and the northern frontier of Arnor and looking at how they were conceiving of the northern frontier and thinking more about the North Kingdom and what the North Kingdom meant and the, the whole concept and story of the kingdom of Arnor uh, as Tolkien envisioned it and the really interesting and complicated ways in which they are embodying that in, uh, uh, in the game, which is really fun. So... Let's continue. We, we stopped right at the boundary, at the frontier of Old Arnor last time, so I want to go back there and continue north. Um, so if you if you can uh, port or travel straight to Osferod, that'd be great. If not, I'm going to take the stable over to Tinadir and then just ride up from there. That'll be that'll be fast enough for travel. So. Any hunters that want to offer ports to Tinadir, come on up on stage, and then anybody who wants a ride to Tinadir. Yeah, especially um, for especially for low level folks, that might be that might yeah. be easier. So, I'm gonna I'm gonna head out and get on horseback here. All right. Oh, Lincoln, I wanted to ask before you leave, did you get the uh, Silm Film link? Do you still need that? The link to Silm Film Season 3? I, I, I saw I saw it go by earlier on. I didn't get a, a chance to respond to it. Um, if you still need it, I can I can get you that before I, before I go on. So, Lincoln, if you're still here, let me know, and I'll make sure you get that. I should probably mount up. Oh, you gave him the link, Tungle. Thanks, I appreciate that. Thanks very much. Okay. What do you need? All right. I need... Oh, look, I can go straight to Ostferrad. All this can be mine. Um... Oh. Hey, I didn't realize that. So, mithril coins are different for each server? I didn't realize that that was a... I thought that was an account-wide thing. No? Sorry. Just a little observation that I never I noticed before. I they were before. the same on every server. They're not? Didn't look like it. Oh. The, uh... The amount... The amount that I ha seem to have here on Crick Hollow seems different. Appears oh, to be different. Yeah, the amount you have it's yeah. server by server. Server yeah, by yeah, server. Yeah, yeah, I didn't. I didn't. I thought that was a. Yeah. I thought that was yeah, an account wide thing. Points goes across. Yeah. Okay. See, oh, look at that. I learned something tonight. <laughs> <laughs> learned something about game mechanics this evening. Okay. I'm just gonna head from here. Okay, I want to see our people. They're on their way. They're on their way. Yeah. 
What do you need? I'm in Tinnadir now. I thought I'd just come here first. Yeah, I just ride from here. It doesn't take long. It's a brief ride. All right. No problem. Okay. All right, I assume people are making it up there, so I'm going to go ahead and take off. So while I am yeah. galloping on my way up to Osferod... Um, so do you want Osferod to be the place where... We're yeah, let's just yeah, go ahead and meet right up at there. Osferod. Okay. Yeah, that'll be... I was gonna. I was gonna wait at Tinnadir in case there were people who were coming here and then wanted to ride together. No, I, yeah, I, I, I'd but, yeah. say just go on up to Osferod. I'm gonna go on to Tinnadir and make sure everybody gets out of there. So. Great, thank you. As always, Maven for being our, our, <laughs> you know, little Bo Peep here. Uh, logistic. Just call me the logistical Hobbit. That's right. That's right. You should really get Maven like a. Um, can you get like a cosmetic shepherd's crook? That would, that's oh, really. I sh yeah, surely there must be. I'll have to go look for one. <laughs> if, if that doesn't exist, that totally should. <laughs> it's absolutely, it's absolutely what we need. So, okay. Well, while I am galloping up to Osferod, let's do a quick review of, not of what we saw last week, um, but of Forakel. So we're, we're going to be crossing the border into Forakel. Um, and, uh, Forakel, of course, is the north. We know very little about it. Um, there is... I'm trying to think of if there is any other reference to Forakel or anything that happens in Forakel other than that one story in Appendix A, and I don't think so. Um, I can't think of any other even brief allusion to anything else about the Lossoth, about the, the, the people who live up in Forakel, um, other than uh, uh, other than that one story. And the, the one story in question, of course, is the story of Arvedui, the last king of Arnor, uh, who ends up retreating there. Hey there, Mr. Stablemaster. What do you need? Oh, just saying hi on Crick Hollow, you know. Um, okay, all right, so here's people near the stable master. That's good. I'll hang here for just a minute. Um, so, uh, so yeah, the story of Arvedui, and we'll talk more about that as we get there. We'll, we'll, we'll see. There's, of course, a very, uh, a very direct allusion to the story um, up in Forakel. Um, it's, uh, which is, of course, a, which, which is a no-brainer, right? I mean, it's one of the things... Um, my, uh, I, I trust the, I have a very high level of trust for the Lotro developers. Um, so that whenever, like, they're developing a new region or bringing in a new storyline, which is directly connected or, you know, which has really direct connections, uh, to the, uh, to the book, um, I, I'm, you know, there, there are several things that I go just very confidently looking for, right? Like, I can't wait to see, no, not if they're going to do this, but how they're going to do this. So, of course, when I first went to Forakel, one of the first things that I was looking for was like, okay, like, all we know about Forakel from the books is the Arvedui story. So, clearly, like, we're going to get this, right? And I was not disappointed. Uh, I, I really like what they do uh, with the Arvedui story uh, and uh, in Forakel. So, we're going to... Um, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna get there. Maybe or maybe, um, um, uh, um, maybe tonight. I'm not sure. Forkel's huge, uh, so we may not get through, uh, we may not quite get there tonight. Um, but okay, I think, uh, so maybe just, just I think everybody's here. This looks yeah, like everybody? everybody okay. Yep. All right, so let's take off here. Um, so we were looking at Osferod last time, and remember, this is our little back entrance, right? Back entrance which faces the northern frontier and so we have this uh, this this cleft here which would make a, a very defensible spot, very sensible, right? When you're talking about the northern frontier of your entire kingdom. This being the northernmost fortress uh, in the kingdom as they've envisioned it. Uh, this being the path still paved but uh, not very well maintained and now grown uh, very much overgrown and fallen into uh, even more significant disuse than many of the other roads in Arnor. 
leading up to the Lost Oath. Now, of course, the fact that they had a paved path, though, hang on, look, the pavement is gone already. No more paving stones. So the paving stones only extended out as far as you could see, basically, from the walls of Ostfarad. Now that we've got, gotten around the corner from Ostfarad, this is just a path. Um, somewhat winding, circuitous path, but just a path nevertheless. Um, so there's there's a trail, there's a road, right, that leads up into Forak House, suggesting at least the possibility of trade. Right? Perhaps. Um, or perhaps not. Maybe this path was just designed to communicate between the town itself, right, between the fortress of Ostfarad uh, and the um, uh, and the wall. Remember, there's a gate up here, which presumably they would have kept a guard on um, to make sure that nobody was coming down uh, from that way. And... Uh, in the latter times, they would have had reason, even during, you know, even later on during the, you know, after the, uh, the Arnorian civil wars, uh, when we're just the kingdom of Arthodyne now, um, really, and not all of Arnor, um, they would still have had reason to guard this pass, uh, because as as you can see in the game, it's it's not far from Angmar, which was their central enemy at the time. And uh, don't forget, we usually have low-level characters, so let's not let these ambushers kill our our, our low-level friends here in our party. Okay, anybody? Uh, anybody getting pounced on? Nope, we're good. We're good. Okay, good. All right. I see we have mostly Crick Hollow natives with us here this evening. That's good. Okay. So now we go into new territory. As we have now crossed out of the realm of Numenorean influence entirely. Pretty much. Maybe or maybe not. That would be an interesting thing to see, right? Do we see any evidence of Numenorean influence up here? Um, anything like ruins, or even from looking at the, you know, sort of the culture and architecture here, is there is there any evidence of um interaction with the Dunedain, right? I mean, again, it's uh, it's the fun thing about the sub-creation that they get to do in Lotro is to imagine these realms and peoples and uh, uh, and do that kind of that kind of world building, that kind of uh, that kind of background story. Okay. So, well, we're getting, we're changing terrain. Right now we've officially crossed into Forakel and we are um, uh, I went down that path and got totally lost the first time I came up this way, as I recall. Um, so we are more snowy. We are getting we are getting to more arctic conditions. I want to not fall off the cliff. That's good. Um, okay. Oh, sorry. There I am running into the cliff side in my eagerness to not fall off the cliff. Um, okay. We still have a path. Of course, following paths like this, I'm now, like, uh, after our discussions, you know, in Chapter 6 of the Fellowship of the Ring, I'm now all like, is this a path made by the trees, or is this a path made by people uh, crossing on it? Now, of course, the uh, Tuli Might is the uh, name of this region that we are in. Um, and, of course, you will notice a certain linguistic trend here, right, uh, in the different sounding names up here in Forakel, and of course many of you uh, know this, I'm looking at the map now, you know, we're about, we're on our way to uh, Kapatkota um, uh, in, uh, and uh, Jakuru, and Jaranit, and Surikaila, and Kurulairi, uh, uh, and Lansima, and Itama, and all of those other names, which don't look like Elvish, and don't look, well, look a little bit like Elvish in some ways, um, uh, but uh, they don't look Sindarin, and, or, and of course, what they are is Finnish. These are all Finnish names, um, and this was, a, this was a really cool choice, of course, by, all right, switching from the map and continuing on. Um, this was a really cool choice by the developers. Since they were making essentially an Arctic culture, right, up here, um, that it was, uh, you know, as they've expressed, it was a, a sort of a no-brainer for them to, um, 
uh, to choose Finnish as the, the dominant language and sort of background culture uh, of this area because, you know, Finland and uh, the Finnish language was, was so important to Tolkien conceptually. You know, as, as most of you know, he was inspired um, by... Ah, fortunately, it is nighttime when we come up here and so we can see the Northern Lights, right? You look at the... Uh, it gets the, the Aurora Borealis up here in the northern sky. I love... Um, I love Forakel at night. The, uh, the northern lights are just gorgeous up here. Um, but um, anyway, okay. So... Um, uh, so their choice of finish is a, is, is a, is a wonderful nod to, uh, uh, to Tolkien's own proclivity for Finnish and his own, his own interest in and love of the language. Um, but you'll notice there's an exception. Look at the map. Look at all the names on the map. Which of these things is not like the other? You notice? Okay, there are two things that are not like the other, right? One is, uh, what is it? Zigilgund over here, right? That is linguistically unlike the other names. Zigilgund, yes, that is unlike the others. That's a dwarvish name, right? Um, so that name is supposed to be, is supposed to be from Kuzdul. Right, which Tolkien composed very little of, so we have to kind of make up Kuzdul because there's very little attested Kuzdul in Tolkien's writing. But anyway, so we've got the dwarfish language there. And Aragorn, yes, exactly. Tower Orthon. Tower Orthon. That's Sindarin. That name. Tower it means forest in Sindarin. So yeah, that's, that's Elvish. All the rest of it is Finnish, right? Except the dwarfish town, and of course that's because there is a settlement of dwarves up here, and, uh, and Tower Orthon, um, the place where we currently are. I'm not sure what to do about that. Why is this called Tower Orthon? Now, I don't think, they don't call it that, do they? Mammoths. I love the mammoths. I have to say, though, it is, this area has led to two uh, complaints, frankly, that I have to make about the game. Um, and I've just never been able uh, to... My, uh, my demands have never been met to my satisfaction on this point. Uh, number one, see this dude over here who's ice skating? I, I, I want to ice skate. Like, why can I not get skates and put them on and skate around like that dude? Like, I want to ice skate. There's lots of ice up here. And I could go faster if I had ice skates. So, like, why can't I have ice skates? But more importantly, why can't I ride on a mammoth? Right? I mean, I, I could sit up there with the moose antlers, right? By the little brazier. It'd be nice and toasty warm. I would like to take a slow travel ride on a mammoth. And that doesn't seem to me too much to ask, you know, that they're sitting here so temptingly. Um, but, you know, we, uh, 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 you know, you can't always get what you want, I guess. And But that's my, my two <sighs> regrets, frankly, about Forakel. Uh, my two grievances against the developers here. Uh, anyway, okay, so please, I need a mammoth ride. Um, that's, now, when we look, what do we know? Okay, we're in Kappa Kukta, so we've passed out of uh, Tar Arthon, which was, of course, the forest that we were traveling to. Now, tell me, but I don't think anybody around here talks it is a brisk day, about is it. Not? <laughs> it, it, it is a brisk day. I noticed that. It's fairly cold. Um... I think if you talk to people up here, I don't think anybody uses that name, Tower Orthon. Right? Um, I am pleased that you will Yeah, they me. use... Right, they call me uh, uh, Sivulinin, right? They're, they're, they don't... And I can't remember... 
anybody using any of the people that we meet using that name, Tower Orthon, um, which suggests it's just a map name, right? Um, <laughs> Julia says the mammoths belong to themselves. Well, I know. I don't want to own the mammoths, right? Each mammoth belongs to itself. I just want to ride on a mammoth. And that seems Tom Bombadil would totally want to ride on a mammoth, I, I think. Um, anyway, so, yeah, I'm sorry. I just... doesn't seem unreasonable. Um, so, um, uh, yeah. So I think it's just a map name. But why is it? I don't know. I I want to know though. I'm I'm and I don't remember any explanation. I did all the quests around here at one point with one of my characters. Uh I totally did the completionist Forak Hell, so um uh I uh and I don't remember any reference to it or any story that would seem to explain it, like any elf story from the region that would seem to explain it. Um so I'm very intrigued by that one L one Cinderin phrase uh, that is uh, that is on the map. Um, yeah, yeah. Now I think yeah, Pontine. I think that some of the characters here talk about the town, talk about Capacota, but I don't think they talk about Tower Orthon. Um, Matt asks who made the map. Well, Matt, that's exactly my question, right? I mean, I I I. Um, one of the things that you notice... Let's see, it's not on this map. Yeah, on the Evendim map, right? And on many of the maps, um, there's a beer stain, right? Like, there's totally, like, a, you, you can see, a, you can see a, 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 a stein mark, right? On the lamp, uh, on the map, and a little bit of, uh, a little bit of spillage, right? Where somebody slopped their beer uh, onto the map. Um, and that's fairly, fairly common. You can see that's a, that, that, that's a common feature. Of uh, a bunch of different uh, maps, you can see it. I don't know. We don't get it in Bree. Usually, it's where there's extra space. Do we get it in the Shire? On the Shire map? Oh, surprisingly, we no wait. We do. Hang on, it's being blocked. There it is. Now, yeah, see, there it is on the Shire map down there. Um, yep. Okay. So uh, uh, that's pretty. So, in, in other words, within the frame of the game. We're not just being given the map, and you can even see the way that they depict it, you know, with like curly up edges and stuff like that. Um, the The map itself is designed to look like an artifact from within the game world, right? Um, but um, anyhow, so okay, um, that does suggest that the maps that we're looking at in the game are game world artifacts made by somebody within the game world. So so Matt, that does it, it, it and and this this one fact, it's it's an easy thing to kind of lose sight of, right? Um, to think about the maps almost like your little mini map up here, right? This sort of automatic game feature. But of course the map is not an automatic game feature. You can tell because somebody put a beer down on it, right? So clearly it's not just an automatic game feature. It is a it is a physical artifact. Uh, from within the game, so someone within the game world must have written it. So Matt, does this suggest that it was an elf who did this? That there was no name, you know? Is is the you know, it was the person like, hey, okay, so right, so fine. This town is called Capacota, great. But uh, what's this forest called, right? No one named the forest. We don't have any name for the forest, so they give it a name, Incinerate, right? Possibly, possibly. Erocheb translates it as uh, uh, forest of lofty pines, uh, basically is what it, what it seems to point to. Though there are multiple possible translations to it. Um, that seems possible, but again, if so, why are there not other? Why just one elvish name, right? I don't know. But anyway, um... It's a fun kind of question to think about. And again, another really neat kind of immersive feature of the game. But let's look at the town. We've been standing here. We're not looking at the town. Um, one of the questions I was asking on the way up here is, what are the... Um, do we see any evidence of Dunedain influence? Well, we've seen no ruins of any kind. 
you know, such as we've seen throughout the Shire, throughout obviously throughout even Dim. Um, uh, oh wow, man, what a light show is going on up here now tonight. Um, the first time I came to this lake, I was wandering through the woods. I'd gotten off the path. I'd left the path, which, you know, you're not supposed to, you know, Gandalf will yell at you, don't leave the path. But I did. And I came and I wandered up to the shores of the lake. And I just sort of stood by the shores of the lake, surrounded by the snow and the trees and looking up at the northern lights. And I was just like, whoa. It was just, it was, it was, an, it was an awesome moment. Um, okay, so we've seen no ruins. And when we look at what we do see... Where we might expect to find ruins in Evendim or in the Shire, we see great bones or tusks, right? Not sure which these are. They look... These are probably... What do you think they are? Ribs or tusks? They are from a rather large animal, in any case. Um, I've never been 100% sure exactly what animal or what portion of animal this was supposed to be. Um, see, uh, mammoth tusks is what I'd always kind of thought of too, but I mean, even if we assume that these mammoths are on the runty side, A, their tusks are shaped differently, right? Much more uh, sharply curved than we see those. And, uh, again, even if we assume that the modern mammoths are greatly diminished from their mighty cousins that were in, the, in olden days, uh, it's still hard to imagine them having tusks of that size. But then when we look at their bodies next to there, they can't even be mammoth ribs, because that's still far too large. Um, it's not an animal we'd want to meet anytime soon. Um... Uh, yeah, exactly. Well, that's the thing. So what enormously large animals do they have up here? <laughs> he asks as the roving threat pops up uh, on my quest log. Um, but, um, of course, one is tempted to say whales, right? And it's possible... Um, yeah, many of you are suggesting dragons. I find that plausible, especially since, as several of you have pointed out, uh, there is um, there's lots of references to the fact that dragons came from the north, right? Um, you know, the north is where the great dragons bred. That's where Smaug came from, right? He came down from the north, so maybe there are dragons up here, right? And of course we find that we find indeed something quite like that um, uh, elsewhere here in one of the other regions of Forakel that we'll travel through later on. Um, I wonder it's possible that they're dragon bones. And I'm not saying that that wouldn't be a little bit awesome because that would totally be a little bit awesome. Um... Yeah, that's a good point, Julie. See, whales, I was thinking of whales. Let's for a moment entertain the idea of whales. Um, could they... Could they whale, right? Uh, do the... Could the Lossoth engage in whaling? Yes. I mean, we know that whales do live in Arctic waters, right? Um, so the ideas of, like, the idea of the carcasses of beached whales... Um, being found and used. Could they kill whales? Yes. I mean, we know that, um, uh, you know, remote peoples in these kinds of areas do, in fact, kill whales. I mean, like, you know, you, you don't, um, you don't need highly advanced mechanized technology in order to kill whales. Uh, just an incredible amount of pluck, uh, and resourcefulness. Um, so, uh, I, th I think that that's possible. But Julia makes a really good point. Julia reminds us that um, the Lossoth's reaction to the ship 
that come, like when they see the elvish ship come in uh, to the bay, they call it a sea monster. They seem to be entirely unfamiliar with seagoing vessels, right? They didn't even have it. They don't even have a classification for it, and they mistake it for a living creature. Um, so. I think Julie is right. I think that we have to rule out the possibility that they are seagoing, that even that any of them are a seagoing culture, um, and that they routinely hunt whales. So I gotta go back to dragons, I guess, because I don't know of anything else that fits. And uh, if you think about them as the bones of ancient dragons. It's kind of hard not to be impressed, right? You have to admit. And think about the, the role here. That is, like, why? Why do this? Why set up these bones here? What's the point of that little bone arch that they've set up? And notice it's the boundary of the town. See how you can tell? Watch. Watch. Here I come. I'm about to go under it. Oh, there it goes. See? The text pops up on the screen. I pass into... Capacota right when I pass into the arch, right? It's the boundary of the town. Um, so it marks the entrance. to the It's not a defense, it's obviously. It's nothing like a fortification. It's a boundary marker. It's a fairly impressive boundary marker, and it's a lot more impressive if you think about those as dragon bones, right? Um... Yeah. And then we come up here, and what do we see? Having passed through that arch, lots of skins, but really interestingly detailed skins designed, right? With really intricate designs. Many furs, as one would expect, it being very cold up here, right? Um, and then if we look at the this which would appear to be a windscreen, right, to a, a, like a, a windbreak, right, to break the, the wind blowing down this, like, channel in the, you know, it's like a little notch in the mountains behind them to keep the, the wind from howling down here. But again, you can see how sort of interestingly patterned and figured the weathers are there. Here we have the cloth doorway to the to this home and we have a bulbous thing what the heck is that what's what's the what's this knob thing why is that there it's got this ribbon business hanging in or know any way I have any idea what that is there are two of them one's smaller than the other one seems to be made of fur the other of figured leather I have no idea what that is. No clue. Amali notes it could be noting what clan or family the home belongs to. Yes, it could. It does look vaguely like a... We got the horns up there, right? I mean, could this be a kind of abstract moose head? Which could be like a, a totem identification, right? If it's like a moose clan or something like that. I don't know. Maybe. It's a little abstract, but it's possible. And like this dude over here has moose antlers without any like moose head kind of thing. The architecture is domed. Either directly domed or else, um, you know, sort of like, like a half barrel like this one and the other one that we were looking at over there. Okay, so what we see from the architecture right away is that the architecture is unlike anything we see anywhere else, right? <clears throat> it does, 
Shire architecture was influenced by the Dúnedain, who were influenced by the Elves, and we see neither influence here. We've seen lots of different architectural styles. Um, we can, you know, we, we were we were looking at some of the, you know, how from the looking at the buildings and the ruins, we can tell some of the story of even Dim and the history of Arnor, um, even the political history and sort of the the bigger story. Here, what we see is a country which really does seem to be independent. Um, of the okay fine I will accept the roving threat quest for crying out loud stop pestering me um, uh, which seems to be deliberately different from everybody like not it does not have doesn't show the same influences as hobbit architecture very different from uh, from I mean if, if the Dunedain ever came here they certainly didn't seem to have any lasting influence on them. Okay, see, I'm looking at these things, these big big bags hanging from this post up here, too, which look like those other ones. Are they offerings, maybe? Or maybe not decorative? Maybe ritual, in some sense? Yeah. Not sure about that. I like the uh, the big bones. Are they carved? Yes, they are. Wait, hang on. Are those animals? They are, right? Pictures of animals. What animals? Mammoths. Those are mammoths. Yeah. There's the body, there's the ear, there's the t the trunk, right? You can see it over here. Body, tail, leg, leg, trunk, tusk. Yes, those are pictures of mammoths carved all up and down the sides of these. Okay, well that's suggestive, isn't it? That's kind of ruining the awesome dragon theory. Yeah. I'm not wrong, right? Those totally look like mammoths. I never noticed that those were actually pictures before. I thought they were just carved, like, you know, like designs or patterns, like the sides of the walls. I can tell they were decorated. Dime and Mungli, you might have it. Sorry, we're we're uh, uh, we're pausing to uh, answer the bag question. Yes. Oh, and Gladys was suggesting the same thing. Okay. The bags. That's food storage. Exactly like bear bagging your food while backpacking. That's exactly what people are, um, what people <clears throat> people are suggesting. Um, yes, that makes a certain amount of sense. Okay, so to keep the polar bears from getting it. We didn't see any bears around here, did we? We'll look more of that in a minute. Okay, ah, gravity, I love that theory. Okay, okay, I love gravity's theory here. Here's gravity's theory. Gravity's theory is that these bones are like probably the rib bones of ancient dragons that uh, that they found, right? Like fossilized dragons from the elder days. Because uh, remember, there were a whole slew of dragons that died in the in the War of Wrath, for instance, right? Um, so they um, uh, so they they found all these bones. Right, and they had no idea what they were from, uh, because you know, like there aren't as many dragons around in the world nowadays. Um, so they fear, like they believed that they were from ancient, enormous mammoths, because they have seen mammoths and mammoth bones, and uh, and so have seen that um, 
uh, that you know bones like this, are, but like these are obviously much bigger. So they have they they imagine that they're from you know. So there's this sort of like mythology of the ancient enormous mammoths of olden days, but in fact uh, they're from dragons. Um, I like that theory. I like that theory. The problem I have with it is like, well, what about the heads, right? Like, surely the dragon skulls and teeth wouldn't look a bit like a mammoth skull or teeth, which they with which they would be familiar. Um, I don't know if uh, their uh, their legends include uh, uh, great carnivorous mammoths, and they do seem to know about dragons, right? There are still some dragons up here in Fornicall, so you know I'm not really sure that. Uh, it would have been a complete mystery, but maybe they're, I mean, they're certainly, the dragons that they have are smaller than mammoths, most of them, right? Pretty sure. Uh, that they, that you see up here in Forakel. So, um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Anyway, um, yeah, th th there is, yeah, they, they, they do have dragons. They do have dragons, but Okay, and Tony says, no, the dwarves stole all the dragon skulls uh, to use, so uh, <clears throat> leaving only the ribs, which the Lawsoth discovered and uh, didn't know what they matched with. And so it's a working theory. Okay, it's, uh, it's getting late. Last thing I want to look at is I want to look at the fauna of the region. We saw a little bit of it as we came through, but I want to... Um, I want to look at it more closely. What do we see? This guy walking his mammoth and taunting me that I can't ride on it. But apart from that, of the mobs, right? Of the monsters in the woods, what do they what do they put around here? Okay, they put wolverines, which are not that dangerous. Okay, so we have wolverines and moose. Okay. Oh, look, we have a, a ruin! It's a Lossoth ruin, though, and a really scared guy. And he's really scared of, as I recall, wolves, right? We got lots of wolves. We got wolves, wolverines, moose, though they're not called moose, right? They're called sylvan frost antlers, right? Um, right, they're elk. Moose is the American elk. Um, uh, anyway, so, okay, so we get, we get animals matching the terrain, right? So we get wolverines, wolves, and uh, and moose. But did you see what else we had? Right? <laughs> Mung says they couldn't get the rights to the word moose. Now the problem is they, like, the, the moose is an American word, right? So they know better than to you to call them moose. Uh, remember how, I mean, I don't know if you've heard this story about how um, uh, like in the very first promo picture that they put out when they were releasing Lotro at the very, very beginning, um, they uh, uh, they showed a picture of like a beautiful forest scene with squirrels, but they made them gray squirrels instead of red squirrels, which is what they would have been in England. Uh, and like a bunch of people were up in arms about like, you have American squirrels in this picture and that's inappropriate to Middle Earth. Uh, so yeah, they can't call them moose. Um, Okay, so, so far what we've seen, mostly animals, right? Mostly, you know, sort of arctic animals, wolves, moose, uh, wolverines. Uh, we do get some goblins over there. There's, there's a goblin settlement on the, on the far side of the lake, not too far from where we are now. Not really a settlement, but we, 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 we find some goblins over there. No, there's a little, little hideout that they have up there. Um, and, um, they, um... But there's, of course, one other thing that we... <laughs> I see we have some Michigan fans with us who are excited about the Wolverines. But anyway, um, we have... Um, we also saw Frostgrims, right? Well, we saw a Frostgrim, I think, briefly. That um, swirl of, like, blue light that looks like a little, like, blue, shiny vortex thing. Um, and... Uh, that's interesting to me as one of the first mobs, or a mob in the first area that we meet in Forakel, right? Because, um, what is that, you know, what's the story that they're telling, 
by the mobs that they have, right? Okay, so let's... Okay, so one, this is a remote and still largely unsettled area. There's a village here, right? And we see some evidences of, like, the civilizing of this region. Like, again, that guy who was walking his mammoth, right? <clears throat> who was clearly pursuing a... Um, uh, like a trade route, right? So there's there's obviously, uh, uh, you know, some uh, it's 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 a settled country with civilization here, but the main message that you get is that it's it's mostly wild, right? It's mostly uh, uh, it's mostly wilderness, full of wilderness animals. Um, we do see um, uh, goblins again, which shows. So what's the story there? What 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 does that story suggest? That even here. Right, uh, you know, goblins have come, and of course, if we look at the big map, right, um, we can see we know that the Misty Mountains here, right, that come up and then extend across uh, Angmo. Let's look at the even bigger map here, right? Okay, um, you remember where the goblins that uh, they fought in the Battle of Five Armies, where they were centered, right? Where was the capital? of the goblins, the capital city of the goblins that were, uh, uh, that participated in the Battle of Five Armies, Mount Gundabad, right, way up here at the northern end um, of uh, the Misty Mountains. Uh, so it is not surprising to see that, you know, orcs and goblins from the Misty Mountains um, have, uh, um, and by the way, the answer to that question, which I mentioned earlier in class, are orcs and goblins the same thing? Yes, they are. Um, anyway, they. Um, uh, so it was not at all surprising to see some of them making forays out into even remote regions like this. So, okay, so we can see, though they don't seem to be part of a big overall conspiracy, they're not the primary bad guys of this region at all. It's a fairly isolated little conclave of them uh, down there, um, which is why, for those of you completionists out there, that... Uh, sadistic quest that the Greyhammer dwarves send you on at the end of, uh, in the epilogue of the of the volume two of the epic quest, uh, I found so particularly irritating in Forakhel. But anyway, um, the other thing is is we see Grimm's. Now, the Grimm seems to be a purely elemental force, right? It is like this swirl of of ice and frost, right? Um, how I understand that. Right, how I, uh, um, at first glance, the Grimm's might seem to be quite um, sort of stretching the bounds of Tolkien's world, right? And in a sense, they are, but I don't find them unfitting in Tolkien's world. I think they make, I think they're very defensible in Tolkien's world. Um, because it's pretty clear, especially in Tolkien's earlier writings, and this is something we've been talking about uh, in the Treason of Isengard class that I'm doing right now as we're looking through. You know, we've now just gotten to the first, we just did the very first draft of the Bridge of Casa Doom chapter uh, in the last class. We did the, in one class we did the first draft of the Bridge of Casa Doom and the first, uh, uh, the first draft of the Cracks of Doom uh, at the uh, in the same class it was awesome. So much fun last Wednesday night. But anyway, um, one of the things that we've been seeing there in those early drafts of The Lord of the Rings is that Tolkien's concept of Middle-earth, especially as he articulated it back um, in his earlier writings, was much more animistic, much more like the spirits of the wilderness are, are much more visible and present and active. Um, and just as we see, you know, in uh, in big and respectable forests, uh, there are trees that have kind of gone rogue, right? Um, have achieved, a, you know, have a, a, a sort of, have an awareness and a consciousness and the ability to influence the world around them. Um, so there would be other elemental spirits that may go rogue, right? Karathras is kind of a spirit that has gone rogue, a bigger one, right, clearly. Um, but, uh, exactly, Julia, a lot like the spirit of Karathras. The spirit of Karathras is clearly more significant, right? Um, a spirit who is sort of master of that whole mountain, right? Master of that whole region. Um, probably not master in the Tom Bombadilian sense. Um, but, um, but yeah, I, I mean, I think it's, um, it's pretty clear that in Tolkien's imagination, there were minor spirits, you know, uh, like minor Meyer spirits, um, who inhabit 
realms all over the place. So the impulse that the Lotro people showed in, for instance, um, Garth Agarwin uh, in, uh, in, the, in, in the Lone Lands, right, with the whole Red Maid quest line and everything, um, that, you know, that river there, those, those, those water lands had a, a water spirit there, um, which, um, you know, got corrupted by the people who live there, which, again, I, I love that idea, and I think that the way that they handle that is really, really fascinating. Um, that itself, by the way, would be a really interesting, um, would be a really interesting study, actually, to look at the, the, the Red Maid quest line and how they envision that story, how they conceive of the relationship between human inhabitants of a place the natural spirit of that place and the physical place itself, right? Uh, that those three things all kind of coming together, and so to to look at what the Red Maid quest seems to suggest about those things, and what Tolkien seems to suggest in kind of parallel cases, um, I think it's it's really it's really cool. Um, but um, anyway, that's how I understand the Frost Grims too. Frost Grims are smaller. Right, so that the, but the idea of these Grims, all of the Grims that we see are basically elemental spirits. They seem to be very minor spirits, but which have, which are malicious, at least appear malicious. The Frost Grims that we meet in the wilderness here in Forakal might not be malevolent; they might not be evil, right? Um, but dangerous to people around them, right? Because their frost spirits, right? So what they do is freeze stuff, which is not healthy uh, for mammals. Um, but um, anyway, that's um, that's how I think Grimm's actually fit in pretty well in uh, uh, in Tolkien's world, and, th and that it's a it it's an interesting concept, and that's what we can see. So in other words, I put the Grimm's almost in this not the same category as the animals, obviously, but um, the same type of thing. Right again, sort of the the natural inhabitants of this uh, of this region. The goblins are invaders. The people are kind of invaders, um, but uh, it is in the sense of being like an invasive species to the region. Um, but the rest of the things that we see here are natural, and that's the first thing we see when we come across. Okay, let's um, uh, let's. Oh yeah. Uh, fine, good point. I'll follow up on that, Oruuran, and then and then and then and then we'll go. Aragorn was just saying the same thing. Um, uh, all of the, you know, all of the enemies that you fight in Lotra are, are broken up into different categories of enemy, uh, in for gameplay reasons. And the category into which Grimm's are fit in the game are the category called ancient evil. Um, but that's exactly the point, right? Um. That, that fits exactly the background story that I'm saying. Ancient evil means an ancient spirit that was corrupted. Now, again, they're, they're categorized as evil, so what I was just saying about them not being necessarily evil, um, I still actually think that, that could, you, could, you could defend that with, uh, with many of the Grimm's. Um, but, uh, but again, the, the point is, when you see things in game that are labeled ancient evil, that's the, that's what they're uh, what they're saying is the storyline of that creature is that it is one of these lesser spirits which has been generally brought into the world often corrupted uh, and uh, made into a creature to that was serving evil you know was uh, part of uh, you know of Morgoth's research and development efforts back in the back in the uh, the first age Um and yes, good, Julia. Julia remembers very, uh, uh, very accurately that um, the extreme heats and colds of the world uh, were attributed to Melkor at the beginning. So it makes all kinds of sense that some of the spirits that fell with him, you know, and that became his ancient servants, would be spirits of extreme heat or cold, and thus manifest themselves as elemental spirits of frost or fire totally makes sense uh, within the context of what we're given in the Silmarillion. Um, okay. With that, I'm going to let everybody go. It's getting super late now here tonight. Um, but uh, thanks for joining me. Uh, I, I enjoyed being back on Crick Hollow again. Um, next time, we'll, we'll probably... 
continue here. I think we're going to be continuing up here in the north until in the book we get to the Barrow Downs. So it's going to be some time, I think. Um, but we'll keep exploring and thinking about the different regions and sections of Forakau. And again, just sort of explore the story that Lotro is creating uh, and thinking and comparing that story to Tolkien's story. I've been having a lot of fun doing this. So thanks, everybody. And I will see you guys again soon. Bye now. <laughs>